prepared to go live in a moment or two. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the December 12th, 2023 meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Madam Clerk, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting us with a roll call, please. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Cummings. Here. McPherson. Hernandez. Present. And Friend. Here. We uh, begin with a moment of silence. Anybody like to dedicate today's moment of silence? Uh, and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Sorry, we'll just take a, a moment of silence for a second. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacio. So, are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, Chair Friend, members of the board. We have one um, correction on the regular agenda, number seven, uh, there's additional materials. There's revised memo, packet page 18, which has replaced an updated list of proposed changes for parks, open space, and cultural services. There's also a revised attachment A, packet page 40, which has replaced, this is a corrected fee schedule. There's also a revised attachment B, packet page 54 through 56, which is replaced, and there's a corrected resolution. That concludes our corrections today. Thank you. Are there any board members who would like to pull an item from consent to the regular agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll open it up for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors, or that are on the consent agenda, or on the regular agenda, if you are unable uh, to stay for the regular agenda. Good morning and welcome back. Hello, my name is Stephen Homan. I've lived in this county since 1973, and I'm here about item number 53 on the consent agenda. I'm here to ask you to please take it off the agenda and schedule a public hearing for it. It's a controversial matter. It's not a routine matter. It's a matter regarding the FEMA floodplain in Felton and the effect that this project might have on people downstream and across the river. I've sent your board about a nine-page email uh, with the technical reasons why the proposal is flawed, but I'll just read you one little section here. Uh, code, of, code of Federal Regulations 60.3C10 states that 
once FEMA has mapped a floodway, then no development in the floodway can cause increases to the base flood elevation. We're talking about a project that can never happen. We're trying to make an agreement uh, regarding maintenance of a project that's never going to happen. We're trying to find that a CEQA uh, has, an, uh, there's no CEQA effect when there's a major CEQA effect. It, the, prop, the project is in a floodplain and a floodway. That's a 100 year, 1% floodplain. There are no buildings in the park where this is proposed because you can't build in a floodplain. The, the pump track is the same situation as a building. It will, it would be the same effect as if you built a building of the same footprint and height. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roman. Is there anybody else that like to address? Please feel free to line up uh, to help expedite the process. We appreciate everybody coming this morning to speak. Good morning and welcome. Hi, um, thank you. Thank you all for your service and thank you all for being here and listening to us speak and hearing us. My name is Virginia Wright. I live in Felton Grove, right next door to the um, Covered Bridge Park, and I live in the floodway, which is, means the San Lorenzo River rises and it completely covers the park and our neighborhood and it leaves two to three inches of mud in its wake, and we have to dig it out. I don't think the trail stewards understand the impact that that has. Um, it's a lot of work to clean up after one of these floods that happened, four floods this January. We're expecting another one this winter. So that's just to emphasize what the previous speaker just said. But I am here to talk more about the public process. And I think this is really serious for, and for the supervisors to hear that this whole process has been flawed from the beginning. Um, parks met with the Santa Cruz Mountain Trail stewards a year or so ago without public input and uh, planned this this pump track to go into Covered Bridge Park without community input. And then they gave to the trail stewards all communications and all, it was on the trail stewards website, the trail stewards sent emails. When you went to the meetings to sign up, I now get fundraising emails from the trail stewards because I signed up at a public meeting. And all this time, it was assumed that the trail stewards would have the, the uh, MOU to build a pump track. So it's incredibly inappropriate use of public land and public time and public funds for a nonprofit with a special interest, which is building pump tracks and trails, to come in at the beginning of the planning process. They should come in halfway through after the public meetings have already happened. And the reason that I would ask you not to approve the MOU with the trail stewards is not because they're doing good work. They do great work and I admire them greatly, but you need to respect the public process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming this morning. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning board. My name is Archer Arce. I'm IT support services supervisor in the information services department here in the county. And I am here today to recognize a remarkable career of this individual, Stephen Krofsky. Stephen has been a cheerful cornerstone of our workforce, dedicating over two decades of service with direct interaction and support that has touched many within the county. On behalf of Chair Zach Friend and our entire community, it is my honor to present this proclamation to Stephen, celebrating his distinguished career and invaluable contributions. The proclamation reads, Whereas, after 22 years of faithful and dedicated service, Stephen is retiring from his position as IT Support Services Analyst 3 in ISD, and whereas Stephen has been an exemplary public servant, known for his unwavering integrity, dedication, perseverance, and compassion, often going above and beyond the call of duty to meet the needs of our county staff and departments, <clears throat> whereas throughout his tenure, Stephen has played a crucial role in managing MDCs, supporting the maintenance of CAMA software, administering FE accounts, and successfully resolving a countless array of technical support and account management requests. And whereas, as a true farmer at heart, Stephen has <clears throat> brought his duct tape and bailing wire approach to fixing things, relying on common sense and ingenuity to resolve complex technical challenges, much like he would in the fields of his upbringing. And whereas Stephen's commitment to excellence professionalism and the betterment of our services have earned Stephen the respect and admiration of his colleagues and peers. <laughs> now, therefore, Zach Friend, chair of the board, extends his deepest appreciation and gratitude to Stephen and wishes him a fulfilling 
enjoy his retirement, and hereby proclaims December 29th, 2023 as Stephen Karofsky Day in honor of his exceptional service and contributions to our workforce. I just want to say thank you for this great recognition. Um, it's just been an honor and privilege to serve so many people, just building friendships, relationships. Um, yeah, and just the team that's been, I've been around everybody. It's just been so joyous. It's just like a second family to me. And not many of you know, I come from a large family. It's, um, it's, I have like 147 in my own family. So it's it's great that I can just build these relationships just like that. And I feel the love, care, and just support of you folks over the years. Thank you very much. Truly grateful and appreciative. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is Matt DeYoung. I'm a Felton resident and also the executive director of the Santa Cruz Mountain Trail Stewardship. I'm here this morning to speak uh, in support of the items related to the Felton pump track proposal. Uh, our nonprofit's been working closely with the county to develop this, this uh, project and get community input. Uh, we've got a great track record of creating these community spaces with Santa Cruz County and all of our other local jurisdictions. Uh, we're really excited to bring much needed recreation infrastructure to the San Lorenzo Valley. So yeah, again, I urge you to approve that item and thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Blair Zim. I'm a local of Felton, born and raised for 30 plus years. Um, I'm here speaking for the youth and families of our community. Felton is my hometown and where my family and friends live. The lack of activities is at an all-time low in that area. Creating more outside activities is a goal with all involved. Why a pump track? People love to ride their bikes here, from locals to our visitors, bicycle enthusiasts that live here who want to share two wheels with their family, to couples that want to go ride their bikes together, to the youth that need a positive, healthy activity at their local park. It's healthy and fun for all. That's why I vote yes on the Felton pump track. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for waiting. I would like to express my concerns over the proposed MOU between Santa Cruz County and Santa Cruz Mountain Trail Stewardship, also known as SCMTS. Many community members have witnessed unprofessional behaviors from the Parks Department, and most notably by the director, Jeff Gaffney. This project should have been better managed by the Parks Department on how it was presented to the community and whether or not we had any say in their decisions. Not informing our entire community of their unilateral decision for a 10,000 square foot pump track to replace a 2,500 square foot volleyball court in Covered Bridge Park in Felton has had negative impacts. Many of us have felt unsafe and were verbally attacked after speaking up after the poorly run town hall meetings paid for and organized by SCMTS, who had invited their out of town bike enthusiasts and neglected to inform or invite the actual residents of SLV. Additionally, a prominent community member told me she was yelled at and felt bullied by Director Gaffney right after leaving the county meeting because she spoke up against this pump track during the open session just two months ago. Mr. Gaffney's actions have lacked both professionalism and communication skills. He clearly favors this nonprofit that profits off building pump tracks anywhere they can, regardless of whether or not it makes sense in a known floodplain. I am requesting on behalf of the community to halt any forward action, including agreeing to an MOU until the following stipulations can be created and met. <laughs> Number one, Mr. Gaffney and his department receive anchor management training, as well as training on communication skills and professionalism. Number two, the Parks Department and SEMTS start over and provide by mail to our entire community paid for by SEMTS a clear understanding of the proposed project 
and offer an online survey conducted by an unbiased neutral party where we can safely voice our concerns and offer alternative options for upgrades to this space for the entire community to vote on. Please make these needed stipulations to the proposed MOU to let us know you care about the safety of our community members. Thank you. Wanting a mindful upgrade. Thank you. Thank you for Good morning and welcome. And welcome to the youngest member speaking in public comment. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, my name is Zika, Zika Glux. I'm from uh, Happy Valley. And I hope this is the right time to bring this up. I didn't see it on the agenda, um, but I'm here to support your consideration of a resolution for a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, I think it's past time that we made it, took a stand as a community against the excessive violence uh, against civilians in that part of the world today. Um, I think there are some other people here if you wanted to stand up to show your support, um, if you're here for that purpose. Um, but yeah, I, I've read a bit of what you guys had in mind. Um, I support most of it, and I hope you can come to a consensus on a resolution today or, or very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. My name is Carolyn Cuspa. I am a Jewish American member of our community and um, born and raised in Santa Cruz and work in Santa Cruz. I live in District 1. Um, and yeah, I'm here for the same purpose, really, to support um, moving forward with a ceasefire as soon as possible. Um, I do think it's high time. There have a lot of things been going on, like they invoked Article, I think, 99 um, to hold, let me see. Yeah, to formally warn the Security Council that Israel's war on Gaza is now a global threat. Um, and then I believe this morning in New York, they are um, holding a special meeting because um, Resolution 377A was invoked by Egypt and Mauritania. Um, and that resolution says that if the UNSC is not able to discharge its primary responsibility maintaining global peace due to lack of un unanimity, the UNGA can step in. It's been invoked only 13 times before, and about five times it was due to conflict, um, aggressive. Um, it was it was because partially because of Israel's um, aggression. So I think that that says a lot. And given that we were the only country to veto, um, I think that we get um, we're we're really lucky to have local government to be able to speak through. Um, and I really appreciate you putting something on. So yeah, ceasefire is really important and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Hello, Ludmila Boyka. I was here numerous time and uh, I asked you for help because I still have problem with mental health department who is very uh, difficult to have deal with and their attitude drives me crazy and i don't understand like you five people here to help people not to help um, you know any negative practices and neglect you here to help people so i'm every time i'm here i'm asking please help because mental health department employees do not do their job and i hope that the new director of behavioral health division will be open to you know to help people and to um fix the that that uh, i don't know that line of uh, duty that they do not have there. They get salaries, you know, on time and their salary is raising every, you know, year and they get paid very well. But why they don't do their job and why you don't keep them accountable? You're here also to keep them accountable. Nobody kept accountable. My daughter developmentally disabled with schizoaffective disorder, three years was not getting food stamps because they turned her around and sent her away and told her that she will hear from them. Every year they do that. And she was not able. Is it an indication that she needs special help? They did to me the same thing. When I tried applying on her behalf, they did to me the same thing for 45 days. I couldn't get food stamps for her this year for 45 days when I asked for three days. What is going on? Please look into that and make mental health department, you know, work honestly and decently, you know, and work with families. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Morning. 
My name is Arthur Burns, and I am a registered voter in the city of Santa Cruz, and I am calling on the council to, one, hold a special meeting in December, two, put a ceasefire resolution similar to the Oakland resolution on the special meetings agenda and pass that resolution, and here is why. In 1898, Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, wrote in his diary, I have created a Jewish state in Palestine. The problem with this statement is that you cannot establish a Jewish state in a land full of Arabs. You have to remove the Arab. The plan conceived 125 years ago reduced Palestinian land from 90% in 1900 to 44% in 1947, 22% in 1967, and 10 to 15% today due largely to the addition of 700,000 Jewish settlers appropriating additional land in the West Bank. In parallel, the people of Gaza have endured 75 years of refugee status and displacement, 56 years of occupation, and 16 years of living in concentration camp conditions. This history demonstrates the clear intention of the Zionist movement to remove Palestinians from the land of Palestine, as envisioned by Theodore Herzl, Krem Weizmann, Zeb Jamatiski, and a host of other Zionist leaders. These are the true motivations for the destruction of hospitals, mosques, churches, schools, 60% of the housing stock, not to mention the denial of water, food, and electricity towards the goal of ethnically cleansing Palestinians using the genocidal attacks perpetrated on the people of Gaza by the IDF. Santa Cruz City must adopt a resolution demanding a ceasefire in Gaza. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Basil OJ. I'm a resident of District 2. Uh, honorable members of the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors, I stand uh, before you today to thank you for your support for an immediate ceasefire resolution in Gaza. The ongoing conflict has far-reaching consequences. It's not only over there that we have a, an issue, but that is actually happening here with us in our community. Within our community, the attacks in Gaza are regrettably fueling anti-Semitism and anti-Islam sentiments locally impacting the very fabric of our diverse county. Three weeks ago, I went to the hospital to visit a 21-year-old Stanford student who was a victim of a hate crime simply for wearing a t-shirt that said in Arabic, Damascus. The perpetrator shouted foul language and told him to go home before running over him with his car. This happened right on campus at Stanford in the middle of the day. As a father of a son, as a father of a son who also goes to college, I felt compelled to visit him and offer assistance. This is only one of many incidents happening on a weekly basis. By your support, we can contribute to fostering understanding, tolerance, and ultimately a more harmonious community. We owe it to our children, and you owe it to the county as well as to your children. With your support for a ceasefire resolution in Gaza, we'll send a powerful language that our county stands for compassion, justice, and a world free from devastating impact of conflict. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I uh, was saddened to read the letters to the editor in this morning's Sentinel that on December 8th, the Brantha 40 fire station closed. That's a travesty. And um, I'm, I'm really... Uh, I, I'm very sorry this happened, in, and um, my heart goes out to the Branson 40 residents. They have also lost their voice representation on this uh, in their fire district. They have no voice at all. Moving on, I want to address consent agenda item 20, um, where your board is authorizing a $75 stipend for all commissioners. I'm against this for many reasons. Commissioners... Commissioners volunteer to do this as public service. $75 is not only unnecessary for them, it is also putting an additional financial burden on the county, not only for the money to pay, but the administrative part of it. When you're coming to the public for a sales tax because you have no money, 
Instead, please give the commissioners free parking passes so they don't have to run out in the middle of the meeting and move their car. I've seen that happen. Give them free parking passes or a free bus pass. That will give them more incentive than a $75 check every time they attend the meeting. I also want to speak out against Measure K, that half cent sales tax for county that city voters are also going to get to weigh in on. This is this is ridiculous, and I am uh, appalled that you can trust the voters to trust you again. After what happened in Measure G in 2018, you said you were going to fund fire, and zero of Measure G is going to fire. And now you come again and ask us to fund fire with a new half-cent sales tax that's permanent. No. Measure K, no. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for waiting. Hi, good morning. My name is Jane. I am a resident of Santa Cruz and the daughter of survivors of the Nakba of 1948, where 750,000 Palestinians were forcibly displayed, 530 villages destroyed, and 15,000 Palestinians killed. My grandparents were all expelled from their homes in Jerusalem, fled the community, lives, and homes that they had worked hard to create and be a part of and with only what they could carry and become refugee, refugees of, for the remainder of their lives. My story is not unique. Every one of us, whether we are living in Palestine or in the Palestinian diaspora abroad, has a similar story. Every generation that followed has suffered as a result of the ongoing occupation by the Israeli government. And the devastating events that we are seeing now in Gaza is a continuation of the 1948 Nakba at catastrophic levels. Over 20,000 are dead and missing. Almost 8,000 of those are children. 25,000 children have been orphaned and 90% of the population has been displaced. When we look to our community of Santa Cruz, we all speak of the importance of human rights and our shared desire for collective liberation. But what happens when we as a community are called to put those values into practice and condemn harm? Collectively, we can be part of how Palestinian history will be told by future generations. Do we recognize the interconnectedness of all communities and the importance of their preservation by calling on a ceasefire? Or do we continue to allow the erasure and ethnic cleansing of a people whose very lives are in active resistance? Too many people have died and the numbers are only going to keep growing. We need an immediate permanent ceasefire now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for waiting. Good morning. Um, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. My name is Sarah and I live in Santa Cruz in Boulder Creek. And I'm appalled at the fact that you've put, um, created the uh, agenda item 28. This is international politics. It has nothing to do with local government. You guys need, and I don't like the snickers I'm hearing either. Um, this has to, uh, you guys need to focus on homelessness, overcrowding, disaster preparedness, public health, and international politics should not be part of our local government. We voted for you. We elected you to take care of local issues. The war is not the title of the resolution says um, Israel, Palestine. This is not a war between Israel and Palestine. It's Israel and Hamas and Hamas is a terrorist organization and their goal is to kill uh, Jews. And they demonstrated that by the events that occurred on October 7th, where they murdered over 1,200 Israelis that were not armed, murdering babies, committing sexual uh, crimes that are just abhorrent, and we can't even think about what had happened to those women and babies and elderly people. So I urge you, if you look at the public comments that are written and submitted, uh, over the last day, you'll see that it, there is an overwhelming uh, response to ask you to remove that agenda item and um, and listen to the community. It's only going to create more divisiveness and more pain, especially for the Jewish community. And I plead with you to remove it from the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you. Um, here on two different items, uh, first of all, thank you for being here and uh, being in service. Um, agenda item 20, I actually sit on the um, County Commission of Arts mm -hmm. and I think the stipend is a great idea. I would like to say, make sure that it's not restricted to anyone of a certain income bracket. I think it's a good incentive for people to get more involved in the uh, political process. Um, so any incentive is a, is a great idea. Um, I do it out of the love of my heart and that's good for me, but we want everyone to be involved. So thank you for putting that on. Um, in terms of agenda item, I believe it's 28. Um, a ceasefire is very important. I think if we, as a community, can stand up and say, hey, we don't want this bombing to continue, I think it's a really good idea. Um, and as a father, um, as a community member, it's very hard for me to watch uh, the death and destruction that's happening every single day. So this is one little step that's going to hopefully make this better. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Yeah, good morning. It's nice to be here. It's December 12th, 2023. Really appreciate the, um, the people's participation showing up and talking about the things they strongly believe in. Not that I agree with everything that was said here. Um, I'm not quite sure where to begin, except that, uh, I'm looking at these corporate flags. You know, the United States was a constitutional republic for less than 13 years. What we have going on here is a complete shit show. And, um, I really do appreciate the comments that came before me. I'm glad that I waited. You know, I probably have the only initials in this room, Jew. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I also have better attendance physically during public comments than any of you five gentlemen. Um, so to witness what you guys are rubber stamping, I mean, what the citizens don't realize is that the Santa Cruz County, the city of Santa Cruz, the city of Scotts Valley, the city of Capitola, they're charter cities and counties. And under those guidelines, they are controlled by the city and county managers that control these supervisors and city council members like puppets. So here people are pleading that these supervisors do something for them, but they're under no obligation. So 41 seconds. I'm not going to read what I have written here, but I wish I could. So again, looking at the minutes and how this is really just a joke. When you look at how the city of Santa Cruz operates, citizens, individuals can pull items off the consent agenda and talk on them for three minutes. I know I've done that several times, but my comments have to do with the minutes. And on page 112, there's just the title of minutes. There's nothing that has been said. I think 20 people spoke before me and I wonder what is going to be recorded in the minutes because it's the clerks that have the most important job in here. They are the historians. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Bill Rents. I'm a registered voter in the city of Santa Cruz, and I'm here to support the resolution demanding a ceasefire in Israel, Gaza. This is a matter of important local concern. My taxpayer dollars, your taxpayer dollars, all of our taxpayer dollars are paying to fund the slaughter of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza and we're paying for it. We are buying the weapons that are doing all that and all of the money that goes into supporting this war could be much better used, reinvested in local matters in this country, in immigration problems in this country, in homeless problems in this country, all of that money that could have been spent there is now being spent to kill people in that unfortunate country. And so I hope you will keep this item on your agenda and on your consent agenda and pass it as you would regularly do. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Hi, my name is Sharon McCorkle, and I am from um, a resident of Boulder Creek voting in this county. Um, I'm here to oppose um, the uh, the amendment about the, I mean, the proposal for the ceasefire uh, resolution. Um, pr uh, primarily, I don't really think it's our business as a local government to take, you know, stands on, on uh, complex issues, international issues. 
um, when we've got so much to do here. You know, um, my, my vote for supervisor goes to people that are going to govern, not to people that are going to make proclamations. And so uh, that would be my first objection. Also, as a member of a Jewish community, of the Jewish community, um, you know, I've seen how these kinds of proclamations tend to generalize into anti-Semitism and people start to attack our community. Um, so I don't feel that this is the appropriate forum for um, that kind of resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Fredericks. I live at 258 Circle Drive in Felton, and I'm here to comment on the MOU that gives um, the Mountain Bike Association the green light to build a pump track in Covered Bridge Park. I live a block away from Covered Bridge Park. I cross through it every day. I walk my dog in it. I cross through it to go to Safeway, cross Graham Hill Road. I cross over the bridge to go to Wild Roots Grocery Store in downtown Felton. That park is the center of civic life in Felton, and it's a very small park. The MOU gives, you're giving permission by approving that MOU to make a big change in this park. The current volleyball court measures 2,400 square feet. The footprint of the new pump track will be at least four times that. This is a small park. Last Sunday, there was quinceanera photography on the bridge. The Quinceañera group moved into the parkland, into the grassland, and you know, trying to find the perfect spot for the late winter evening light. The week before on the bridge is, was a wedding, and then there's countless birthday parties in the park. And then most movingly, the grassland, which uh, will then become a pump track, was used several weeks ago while I was there. For the last rites of a dog, the family brought the park to put the dog down and form a circle of grief around it. This is the kind of park it is, and you're changing it into a pump track park. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, gentlemen, supervisors. My name is Jeffrey Smedberg. I wanted to sh show you a poster that I was recently given. I'm very honored to share this poster uh, um, that was uh, um, Sherry Carnival originally uh, made this poster. I'm going to show the audience as well. I am also the uh, executive vice president of the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council, which last week passed a resolution uh, calling for ceasefire in Israel and Gaza. And I'm, we're very pleased that you have on your agenda today uh, a resolution like that. Um, unfortunately, uh, not everyone in the world can make the distinction between uh, Jews and the Israeli government. And what's happening in uh, the Middle East right now is there's a lot of animosity building against uh, the Israeli government. And that's take that flows over into animosity against Jews. And so I think the actions of the Israeli government right now are really harmful for Israelis, for Jewish Israelis, and consequently for Jews all around the world. I have, um, and including uh, my friends and family who are Jewish. Thank you. We really support uh, your resolution. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Morning. I'm here to speak to action item uh, number 11 of how we declare a non responsible bidder here in the county of Santa Cruz. My name is Casey Vanden Heuvel. I'm the president of the Construction and Building Trades of Monterey County, and I also represent the members of the Sheet Metal Workers Local 104 here in this county. As we've shown to demonstrate the misclassification and wage theft that are happening currently in this county, as well as work stoppage of contractors not paying their subcontractors on time. 
The way we're going to be able to do this is be able to a road through project labor agreements. Right now, the county has three uh, pre-apprentice classes going on. One here in the Santa Cruz County of Education, one in Watsonville, and one currently at the Monterey Santa Cruz Building Trades Council. They teach these kids soft construction skills as well as the OSHA first aid and an introduction to the many, many different construction unions. Now, how are you going to supply jobs to those pre-apprentices to get into state certified apprenticeships? We're going to do that through project labor agreements with a dedication of local hire, non-misclassification of workers, and less wage theft. Been able to take cars off the road and residents here work locally, we're going to empower the community. A road to these state certified apprenticeship programs into high skilled paying careers and to, into retirements that provide this county with a livable wage is the way we're going to be able to prosper. So please support this action item and let's get some project labor agreements rolling. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Hello. Hello, my name is Katherine Gunderson. I'm a retired public school teacher in this county. I've lived here in this county since March 1973. Um, I'm here because uh, uh, many years ago, I, I started to notice that any reporting from uh, Israel slash Palestine uh, was um, Told to us Americans uh, by the media from uh, an Israeli source. There was no Palestinian story there. And so I started really paying attention and I finally found an outlet that told me what was really going on. And it was KPFA, listener supported radio from Berkeley, who is 75 years. That is only supported by people. Anyway, um, uh i um i know that this uh the majority of of uh u s citizens uh really um are are upset like i am about the ethnic cleansing you have to call it uh in um palestinian indigenous palestinian land i heard yesterday on the radio that egypt um Israel was promising Egypt some unbelievable amount of money to accept um, as many as possible uh, Palestinians going from the north. Um, just this morning, a um, hospital was bombed that was um, women waiting to have babies or had had babies recently. They were all killed. Um, uh, only 11 of the 30 something hospitals from Gaza are still. Um, functioning at all. Um, it's it's really a horrible Thank situation. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Teresa Binnings, um, and I grew up here in Santa Cruz. Um, I live on the west side of Santa Cruz, and as a city, as a citizen of this country, the United States, and our world, um, I stand up against the mass starvation and killing of citizens. Um, in March 20, on March 20th of 2022, the Board of Supervisors passed um, a foreign policy resolution um, standing with Ukraine. I ask for you guys to um, stand up with our community and um, stand up against the mass genocide of civilians so that we can recenter this war against a terrorist group and not against the mass killing of children and mothers and fathers. Um, I do not agree with the mass targeting of um, also, um, uh, oh my God, I'm, people that report the news. Um, I do not see this as simply a conflict um, between Israel and Hamas when so many Palestinian people have been murdered. Um, I do stand very firmly against any form of anti-Semitism. Um, 
I have both a friend who has Ukrainian background and many Israeli friends who stand up against this mass killing of Palestinians. And I ask that our community that I've grown up in, that I believe stands for peace, I, I ask you to speak up with our voice and do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? All right, this will be your last call for chambers before we move online. Morning and welcome. I thank you all for being here. Um, I'm a local mother and local Jew. Um, I have a baby on the way. Um, I just want to say that I am a Jewish person that is pro ceasefire and local. Um, there's been enough innocent lives lost, and I hope you will carry out what you have put on the ballot and Thank you for doing so. Thank you. Good morning. Hey, good morning, board members. Thank you. Um, my name is Lisa Navarra. I'm a constituent in Live Oak um, here in Santa Cruz. And I'm also speaking on behalf of the ceasefire um, resolution um, as a mental health professional, um, seeing what is happening. I mean, the impact obviously on our family, um, Palestinians um, and Jewish people, but also here locally, the impact of witnessing the horrors that are happening, um, there's a huge impact and trauma. And why would we continue that? We are able to have an impact. And so I'm calling on each of you to like, why? Why would we keep going? Why more children? Why more families? Um, when we can actually do something. And I'm trusting you all to speak on behalf of the 66% of Americans and more who do support a ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Okay, we'll close public comment in chambers. We'll now open it up online. Call in user one. Your microphone's now available. Marilyn McGarrett. Um, wow. Um, I wonder how much of uh, the weaponry that the U. Well, I am opposed to U.S. military slaughtering people in other countries like the Palestinians with our taxpayer money. And uh, I'm against our money going for satellites and rockets, etc. I'm going to quote briefly from freethesky.org. December 15th, this Friday, the California Coastal Commission meets in Santa Cruz to consider two Vandenberg rocket launch projects. The public can submit comments and attend freethesky.org. And a little background, the Coastal Commission, I think you're on that, Supervisor Cummings, maybe you could elaborate on this meeting, has some jurisdiction over federal projects in the coastal zone, but it has limited itself by not considering the nature and scope of damage from these rocket launches and satellites to the coastal region, the atmosphere, air, water, and land, and coastal resources, and by not taking into account the extensive environmental damage by both the Air Force over decades and now SpaceX. That includes toxics, contamination, ozone layer damage, and climate change. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll also refer you to cellphonetaskforce.org newsletter titled SpaceX to Begin Worldwide. Thank you, Viviana, your microphone's now available. Hello, my name is Viviana, and I'm living here uh, already seven years in Santa Cruz Mountains. I'm a Jewish Israel proud, and all what people they're talking is really unbelievable. I think you need 
to deal with what happened in here and not in Israel. And if you're standing with God, like you said in the beginning, we are the people of God. And what happening, it's historically unbelievable. You're going and get Jewish people. You see what's happening and you're closing your eyes. What you need to ask for is Hamas. Stop using the people to defend themselves. They are like rats fighting and protecting themselves with human beings. We trying to protect ourselves. You need to stand with us, not with those crazy people. They're murdering and enjoying the blood. Thank you for listening and stop. Stop with this brutal game that wants to play with our life, Jewish people, for all our world. Thank you. Tim, your microphone is now available. Thank you so much. Yes, my name is Tim Delaney. I live in Santa Cruz County uh, near uh, Summit Store, and uh, I've been in your meetings a number of times to speak on all sorts of sorts of topics. I, I do not support this uh, resolution here calling for a ceasefire. You know, and my reasoning is, you know, it's look, folks, this is Hamas. They started it. They can unconditionally surrender. And the whole issue here is I really don't like how the Arab world is behaving. All right. We all know about Sudan and Darfur. And those were black African people that also were Islamic. And the Arabs, okay, that were being funded by China with weapons from China and that oil deal for Steve Jobs and Silicon Valley here, we're all happy to go in there on camel and horseback and murder all those black people. Okay. And so they brutalized them. It was like 400,000 to 600,000, maybe a million of them died. And it's still happening today. And President Obama even sat down with Steve Jobs, you know, a Palestinian and a black man. And it's an uncomfortable discussion to try to get something to happen here to change the supply chain and to get China to stop giving weapons to Sudan and to stop all this. Okay. You know, the Arab world is behaving not much different than uh, Southern whites at the end of the Civil War. They're going to kill every single Jewish person in the entire world unless we back Israel. So I am 100% not supportive of this ceasefire. They need to go in there and clean them out. That's the only thing that I can think of. It's unfortunate. I don't like to see people die, but, you know, that's how it is. Okay. Anyways, thank you very much, and you folks have a fine day. Thank you. Joy, your microphone's now available. Hi, my name's Joy Shendel Decker. I wanted to be with you all in chambers today, but I'm home sick with a cold. Uh, so I really appreciate the continuation of the being able to zoom in. Um, I want to... Just note that like so many other people, I'm in support of a ceasefire. I think this is really basic without getting into all of the sort of um, arguing over the history and the facts um, as different people see them and interpret them. This we just we need a ceasefire. This is a basic humanitarian intervention that, yes, has to do with our local tax dollars being spent on uh, inhumane military interventions instead of coming back into our communities for desperately needed staffing and wages for uh, public health and mental health um, disability services provisions. Um, so yes, please thank you for putting this on the agenda. I support passing it. Um, this is also democracy in action and having this conversation publicly and uh, passing a ceasefire resolution that we feed up through our sort of hierarchical uh, political process. You know, that's what that's what you're here for. That's what our city council members are here for. That's what our board of supervisors are here for. Um, so thank you for doing that. I also just want to very quickly say thank you for putting a, a 
project labor agreement or com community workforce agreement on the agenda, I would like that to be as strong as possible, especially if it's a community workforce agreement that's really inclusive and expansive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stacy, your microphone's now available. Hi, my name is Stacy Garcia, and I live in the San Lorenzo Valley in the 5th District. Um, I also work in human rights and community engagement. I'm calling to express support for the county's ceasefire resolution to end the ongoing genocide of Palestinian civilians in Gaza. What we are witnessing in Gaza right now is a moral failure and a humanitarian disaster. Over 18,000 people have been killed by Israel with American weapons funded by our hard-earned U.S. tax dollars. Um, in addition to calling for an immediate permanent ceasefire, we need to respect human rights and international humanitarian law by all parties involved and provisions without restrictions of humanitarian aid for the people of Gaza. And although I applaud you all for putting forward this resolution, I urge you to consult with Palestinian Americans who are living in our community and who are currently experiencing a rise in Islamophobia and hate speech, some of which we just experienced in these public comments. Um, they have also expressed concerns about the way the statement is written and lack of community involvement in the process. So I urge you to swiftly consult Palestinian community members directly impacted to get their input. The Oakland resolution is a great example of a ceasefire resolution that involved community input. Thanks for listening to our call um, for a ceasefire and call to action for elected officials to take action. Thank you. Thank you. Additional speakers? Yes. Jenny, your microphone is now available. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Lynn Kelly, and I'm, I'm here as a resident of, of Aptos and a Santa Cruz community member, a scholar of Palestine, and a mother. I'm a professor at UC Santa Cruz in the Departments of Feminist Studies and Critical Race and Ethnic Studies, and both my scholarship and my teaching center Palestine and Palestinian Studies. I'm one of two moms to our two-year-old daughter who has come with us to every action over the past two months, a child marching for other children in a world that shouldn't necessitate that. I'm here to support a research-based and historically accurate city council resolution for a ceasefire that stands unequivocally against colonial state violence and state-sanctioned murder of a besieged population. As we speak, Israeli bombs are continuing to rain down on Gaza, murdering over 23,000 Palestinians, including over 9,000 children, a body count that grows every day. Israeli airstrikes have decimated hospitals and universities, targeted first responders and bakeries, murdered journalists and professors, eradicated entire families, leveled neighborhoods and demolished safe routes on which Palestinians were told to flee for their lives. The genocidal attack on Gaza has displaced 1.9 million Palestinians and destroyed over 42% of the homes in Gaza. It has been accompanied by the denial of food, water, medicine, electricity, and telecommunications infrastructure. 66% of constituents in the U.S. are like me, saying no and demanding a permanent and total ceasefire. With respect for the organizing many of you are already doing toward a ceasefire and the belief that local ceasefire resolutions will pressure federal and state actors to act, I'm asking city council to hold a special meeting in December to, or to, to actually use Oakland ceasefire resolution as a model. It names genocide we were witnessing and demands that it stop. The extant resolution also needs to be amended in its clear definitions. This is a genocide, not a war. It is settler colonialism and military occupation, not a conflict. In Palestinians are teaching life every day as they are being subjected to death. The least we can do is amplify their pedagogy and demand a ceasefire to save their lives. Thank you. Noy, your microphone is now available. Hello, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Noi. I live in Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, I'm Jewish, I'm Israeli, and I'm probably one of the only people over here who actually served in the Israeli Defense Force. I've been in Gaza, I've been in Beirut, I've been in Syria. I've seen these terror organizations in my eyes. I've seen what they are doing to the local population. I see what they're doing to the people in Gaza, how they, ha they hide behind hospitals, how they shoot missiles from schools. I've seen it in my eyes, and this is exactly what they're trying to do, to push people, a county from California who has no idea what actually is happening over there, and just read the titles of the news and being fed by propaganda or by misinformation 
political organizations and Israel doing things against the people in Gaza. The, the conflict over there is not between Israel who is doing everything they can to kill their own people, to make sure that people stay miserable, to allow them to kill Jews. This is their mission and this is what they're saying. Hamas organization is a terror organization. That's the definition by the United States, not by Israel, by United States. That's the definition of Hamas. Hamas is ISIS. The Israel Defense Force is doing everything they can to keep the people safe who lives in Gaza. But they still need to kill and, 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 and defeat this organization. There was a ceasefire on October 6, and the people who actually uh, stopped that ceasefire is Hamas. And this county needs to mainly stay out, especially if they are not really in the details of the facts or what is actually happening there. Thank you. Hey. I mean, if nothing else, this community can show respect for each other. It's not that difficult. No, no, the, the point of order is that if you're going to continue to disturb the meeting, then I'm going to have to ask for you to leave. This is your warning. This, this, this is your warning for disturbing the meeting. Boo for both. Mr. Ewing Whitman, just show respect for your fellow community members. People show respect for the things that you say. They listen. This has been a respectful meeting and a very challenging issue. And I think that that's what makes Santa Cruz County a special place. So just honor that. Please. Rachel, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Um, greetings, honorable elected officials. My name is Rachel Kippen. Um, I am a resident of Capitola and I've lived throughout Santa Cruz County for the last uh, over decade, over 10 years. Um, I believe that you are all good people who've chosen to represent your community and I thank you for truly considering this message. I recognize that this issue is really divisive. Um, I thank you for agendizing this resolution, and I urge you to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Call, calling for a ceasefire in Gaza does not equate to supporting Hamas. It does not make you an anti-Semite. Calling for a ceasefire reminds us that we are human and that nothing will be achieved and no lasting peace will be attained by obliterating apartment blocks of innocent civilians, by dismembering bodies and dismembering families, by creating orphans, by inflicting generational trauma on an entire population and by viewing tens of thousands of Palestinian deaths as acceptable collateral damage. These deaths cannot be considered self-defense. It is great disrespect to the thousands who have lost their lives. We must do everything within our power to urge the Biden administration to stop bolstering this massacre. I've heard folks say that you know, this isn't our business to weigh in on. It is. You are our connection to the federal government. I thank you for taking this issue on, and I believe it is truly important. I do echo the sentiment of others that the Oakland, the city of Oakland ceasefire resolution is a very strong resolution, though I do want to say that I just support you hearing a ceasefire resolution and adopting a ceasefire resolution, just period, full stop. Um, thank you again for listening to my comment and for your good work. Thank you. Corey, your microphone's now available. Corey, as a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Oh, sorry about that. Um, Corey Osfor here, Felton resident. I just wanted to voice my support for the Felton pump track project. Uh, young people in San Lorenzo Valley really need more positive outlets especially considering that the nearest pump track at Sky Park in Scotts Valley is due to be demolished to make room for their town center project. Um, and the organization behind this Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship has a decades long track record of partnerships with all of the local land managers, including Santa Cruz County Parks. I trust that they'll do a good job balancing the interests of all stakeholders while providing a desirable new park feature that won't cost the taxpayers anything because they're going to raise the money for this. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole, your microphone's now available. Nicole, 
Oh, hi. Hi, I'm Nicole. I am a resident of Watsonville. I wanted to start off by saying that Nelson Mandela, someone every single one of us has taught about, said, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. And the United Nations Amnesty International Human Rights Watch and Bit Salim, which is an Israeli organization, have all called Israel an apartheid state. Former Speaker of Israeli Parliament, Avram Berg, and over 1,500 academics, most of them who were Israeli, wrote a letter in August, before October 7th, calling Israel an apartheid state. To say that standing up for Palestinians and Palestinian rights is anti-Semitic goes against every single one of our values as Americans and creates an unsafe environment for our students, our families, Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, and our communities as a whole. Over 18,000 Palestinians have died in Gaza since October 7th, and over 10,000 of those people have been children, and over 50,000 people have been injured, and over 90% of people have been displaced. More children have died in Israel's attack on Gaza since October 7th than the total number of children killed in conflicts all around the world since 2019. According to the United Nations, more UN officials have been killed since October 7th since any time in the organization's history. These are deaths because of Israel, because of Israeli apartheid, because of Israeli genocide. Israel is a terrorist state and anyone that supports Israel should be considered a terrorist. Standing up for Palestinian rights is standing up for human rights. We should be doing that every single day and to not stand up for Palestinian rights is to not believe that all human beings are equal and that all people deserve to be safe. People that are standing up for Israel are complicit in our current system and they are people that are ruining the world. If nothing else, every single American should stand up for Palestinians because our taxpayer money is going to military aid in Israel and has been since 1960. So we are all part of the problem and all should be working to solve it. Thank you. Madam Clerk, just to get a sense, how many additional speakers do we have? Currently, currently there are two speakers with their hands raised. If anyone- um, I'll make this a final call then, and those will be the last two speakers just so we can make sure that we can move. On with the agenda. Normally, I allocate about 45 minutes for this, but I wanted to make sure that people had an opportunity to speak. Certainly. Kayla, your microphone's now available. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Kayla Kumar. I live in the city of Santa Cruz, um, and I want to thank you all for um, putting a ceasefire resolution on your agenda today. Um, I actually wasn't, I was in a meeting and wasn't planning on, on being here, um, but I heard that there were some comments that, um, yeah, we're really Islamophobic that were shared at the meeting today. And I just wanted to hop on um, and uh, state very clearly from my heart to Palestinians and Muslims and Arabs that might be listening in on this meeting or in the meeting today that um, I stand with you and I'm really sorry that you had to hear that, um, those comments that are wrong. Um, and I also pray for the healing for the people who said them. Um, so that um, hate can no longer live so obviously in this situation. Um, I, um, like many, uh, support the Oakland resolution um, and hope that more jurisdictions locally will adopt it. Um, it is clear to me and countless um, international NGOs and uh, governmental jurisdictions um, that this is a genocide. It is very clearly a genocide. It must stop. We must do everything possible to leverage our influence to make it stop. Um, and yeah, just a point to um, how important it is at the local level to do this. Many changes have come from the ground up. Local demonstrations get to local governments, get to state governments, to federal governments. This is part of how our system is developed. It's important. It matters. Um, and I thank you all for doing what you can to be a part of that process. Thank you. Thank you. And for our final speaker for public comment. Yes, our final speaker. Mark, your microphone is now available. Mark, your microphone should be available as a reminder at star six to mute or unmute yourself as needed. Appears they're not able to connect. 
Okay, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board for consideration of the consent agenda. We'll start with Supervisor Hernandez. Do you have any comments on the consent agenda? A few comments, uh, I guess 20, 29, 46, and 53, uh, and I'll go in reverse order. In terms of the pump track, um, no, I believe that we always got to provide young people with more activities and more active options as well. We had the opportunity to do a pump track in, in Watsonville, and I remember prior to having the pump track, we had a metal skate park, and we were sitting, one time I went to go visit the skate park to go to talk to some of the young people there, and there was a group that waited in they weren't really uh, riding their bikes or anything, but they were just waiting around and about six of them piled up into a little car and asked them where they were going. They said they were going to a BMX track out in uh, Scotts Valley. And so um, that's when we decided to move forward with a pump track in Watsonville that very day. Um, they didn't state they wanted something. They just, I just saw that they were actually driving to Scotts Valley. But av immediately after they built that track, um, I was really happy to see an entire family of kids from from like 11 to about six. You know, they had the youngest one, or maybe five, the youngest one was on a little bike with night without even any pedals. And they're all there at our pump track. And I asked them where they're from. And they're from Scotts Valley. So I was really happy to see that. Uh, you know, they're enjoying, you know, not the best food. They had this 7-Eleven pizza and big gulps, but I wish I would have dined at better places. But that's what they're having. But, you know, I think it really is a good thing to see. The only thing I'd ask for is in the future is a uh, uh, better bike and pedestrian um, infrastructure around the vicinity. And that's something that we had to do around there, uh, around Ramsey Park. Um, in 29, uh, I want to thank, you know, again, I always want to thank all my commissioners and I want to thank uh, Stephen George and Violet, Violet Lucas for their continued uh, service on the cemetery district. And on item 46, we have the uh, Behavioral Health Youth Crisis Project in collaboration with uh, the Watson Community Hospital. Uh, I want to thank all the staff uh, and all the, all the HSA and the behavioral health staff and, of course, Watson Mill Community Hospital and the district uh, for that work. It's much needed and a blessing to our county and to our community. Um, and item number 28. Um, I think that, you know, it's it's always a, a tough issue, you know, and, I, you know, I have to say I'm, I'm Mexican-American myself and I'm, I don't consider myself too religious. If anything, I'd consider myself a, a lazy boy couch Catholic. But... <laughs> I did read that, you know, the, the church and the Vatican and the Pope did, did declare a ceasefire resolution. Um, and, you know, I, when I read headlines about collateral damage and, you know, the numbers that's occurring, you know, I heard 7,000, I heard 9,000 children right now. But even if it's 7,000, the lower number, it's still a tremendous amount. And I have to say that collateral damage is more than just, you know, civilian casualties. It's really, you know, mothers children, families, and this is non-combatant, right? Because they're not talking about Hamas, they're talking about civilian casualties. And, you know, it, while it is also an international issue, I think that there's three things that I do want to say. We have set precedent. I, this board in March did do a, a resolution on Ukraine. And, uh, you know, if we could call to end a war in Ukraine, we could, we could do the same to call a ceasefire in Palestine. Um, the move, you know, the, the the other thing is the more the conflict continues, and I think someone stated it too or, or mentioned something about the students in Stanford, but also in, in Burlington there are some students, but the more the conflict continues, the more is Islamophobia and anti-Semitism will grow here. So I think that it's the best step to call for a ceasefire. Um, I, you know, another way to, to clarify what a ceasefire means, it's simply peace. And I mean, who's who's really against peace? I believe that the advocates here today, uh, the advocates of the ceasefire, are simply asking for peace. And I think that's that's really what Santa Cruz is about. So that's my comments. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to thank all the people who came here and spoke today, and uh, were able to amplify your voice so that we could hear uh, where our community stands and where our community is coming from. 
and to do so also in a way that's respectful. Um, it's really important that as a community, um, we can, we're able to have difficult conversations and that we're able to, you know, express our support or opposition to whether it's resolutions or projects, but that we're all going to try to hear each other out. And I'm sorry that my voice is gone. So I hope you can all hear me as best possible. Um, first thing I did want to say is as a California Coastal Commissioner, the commission will be meeting here in Santa Cruz, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week, and our meetings start at 9 a.m. And so I would encourage you all to visit the Coastal Commission's website because there are a number of items that are important to our community in, in case you want to weigh in. Um, but you do need to sign up um, if you want to speak during oral communications. Um, moving on to our agenda, I want to thank um, item number 14, which was the November 14 minutes. I want to just thank staff for um, the corrections there. I think they better reflect the motion that was made. Um, Item number 20, I also want to thank staff on their work on this related to um, commissioner stipends. Uh, one of the things we've been having a lot of conversations about is increasing equity and for lower income people to be able to participate in our local government, having some kind of financial, um, just just a small stipend for them attending meetings can really help them if they need to get childcare or if they need to just offset the cost of not being able to work to be able to attend those meetings. And so I just want to thank uh, the staff for working on moving that forward and let's continue to monitor to see how that goes. Um, um, as it relates to the ceasefire, I, I just wanted to say that um, this is an item that um, I put on the agenda and I just want to give a little back history to it, which is that um, over the course of the last month or so, we've been receiving um, letters from the community asking us to put on a ceasefire for consideration. We've probably got hundreds, if not maybe close to a thousand letters from the community asking for this. And I think that it's important as local government that we are responding to our community when they're asking us to do something. Um, I looked at numerous uh, resolutions and took numerous resolutions into consideration. Um, but when we move forward with what's before us, it really is asking for peace. It's really asking for, you know, the, the fact that we see every day that there are thousands, hundreds of children and families and innocent people that are getting killed in this conflict. When we're hearing that because of the lack of water, many people, many more people die from disease than the actual bombing that's taking place. This is a humanitarian crisis that we need to figure out how we can resolve in the best way possible, while also defending the people who are, who are Jewish and Israeli and those who are Palestinian, we need to figure out how we can come together and get our federal officials and other countries involved to help resolve this conflict. That's what this is rooted in. And I know that many people in this community really advocate for peace. And as we're moving into the holiday season, I think it's appropriate that we express our intent to try to see a peaceful way forward. And so um, that's really the intent behind this. Um, it's not to pick a side one or the other. It's really to advocate for having this conflict and in a way that will result in people being able to live their lives and stop seeing so much loss in what is a growing humanitarian crisis. And so um, that's all I have to say about that, but just wanted to give some comments on that item. Um, item number 41, which is the Sheriff's Correction Officer hiring. I do want to thank staff. This is an item where um, there's incentive pay to help deal with some of the vacancies that we have related to the Sheriff's Department. And so I guess I'd ask as a Part of the direction is that during the budget hearing process, we get a report back on how that um, recruitment has been going and how the incentive pay has been, um, you know, increasing our ability to fill those vacancies. I also um, will follow up with staff, but I'd also like to see, um, just as a new supervisor, I'm not aware, but if there's any way that we can have incentive pay for retention of workers. I think that's something we may also want to consider. Obviously, there are going to be financial implications, but you know, we we talk about incentivizing hiring people, but what kind of incentives can we put in place to retain workers here? Because losing workers to other communities is obviously a big deal, but if we can do something to help retain them in some kind of financial incentive for those who are here for five years, 10 years, 15 years, I think that would be a good way to help us you know, deal with some of these staffing issues. Um, yeah, item number 46, the Watsonville Temporary Youth Crisis Program. Again, I want to thank staff for their work on this uh, to help us have a facility where kids experiencing mental health issues can go and, and receive treatment. 
Um, but in addition to the direction, I'd also like to see if we could add direction that um, that we send letters to the local jurisdictions, the county office of ed, and the school districts informing them of this action. I know that there's been some comments we've received from some of the other cities of needing to do more around this, and I just think this is a good educational opportunity to let the, the other jurisdictions know um, what we're now doing for children in our community. And... And as it relates to the Felton pump track, um, I know that change in our community is really difficult, but as someone who grew up in a neighborhood where we saw the loss of public amenities for children, we saw basketball hoops getting taken down, we saw two of our bowling alleys closed, and lack of opportunities for youth um, that were healthy outdoor activities, a lot of kids in the community started getting into very unhealthy and unsafe activities. And I think that um, to the extent that we can provide youth in our community with more opportunities to be in um, environments where they're visible, where, you know, they, can, they have access to public um, safety if they get hurt, you know, these are things that we can do to help um, provide youth with activities that are um, they're healthy in our community. And so I'm supportive of the pump track, although I know that there's a lot of people who are, you know, opposed to change. This is something I think that we could greatly benefit from. And those are all my comments on the uh, consent agenda. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Supervisor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There are several items I want to address. Uh, num uh, item number 18 on the legislative uh, agenda. Um, that um, I want to thank all the staff and uh, the members of the board who uh, contributed to setting these priorities for the legislature and the state and national level. Uh, we know that many of these issues uh, require a great deal of work and advocacy over a number of years and sometimes decades. So I do appreciate our getting this, our voices to uh, the state government and feds. I'd like to uh, highlight four items in particular, the, the Boulder Creek sanitation work, the uh, FEMA reimbursement efforts to be discussed later today, uh, the property tax reapportionment, and also the elimination of unfunded mandates by the state, which is going to be a critical factor that we have coming up, I've mentioned this before, especially with the state having a, a projected six to eight billion dollar deficit over this year and next. Um, there's a, a tendency to just say, let, let's pass this legislation and let the local governments pay for it. Um, all of these are taking or will take a profound uh, amount of effort for uh, our legislators. And I want to appreciate both the state and federal legislative delegations for their partnership in addressing these needs. <clears throat> on item 28, the ceasefire in the Middle East, I'm going to vote no on this item out of a serious concern of our board meeting taking a particular stand of what's initially our, really a, an international issue. Uh, we have a responsibility to take issues, uh, our positions on issues that do something with the items we have control over. And lastly, I'll say, Sincerely, just as I said a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, uh, let's all pray for peace and a resolution of conflicts all over the world and uh, hope that we see the day when that becomes a reality. Um, this is a very, very troubling uh, matter. We all know that. On item 34, the OR3 grant application, I want to thank the uh, you to the OR3 for pursuing uh, this grant. It's a big reason why we, we created this office to help the county address preventative measures, uh, not just preparedness and responsiveness. Um, the hazard mitigation <clears throat> work funded by this grant will help us better understand and address the aspects of our county uh, that make us prone to disasters such as wildfire. Um, in fact, in the new FEMA rankings, as uh, you may have read about recently, Santa Cruz County of three, more than 3,000 counties in this nation was uh, ranked the 15th highest landslide risk in the nation. And uh, whatever we can do to work to mitigate uh, this and other challenges is critical. Thank heavens we, we missed the storm that just hit the northern United States and Oregon and Washington, but we don't know what's coming in the near future. Um, on item 35, um, the, uh, I want to thank our staff for the ongoing work on the issue known, uh, this is the Boulder Creek, or excuse me, Big Basin Water District. Uh, I know we are in contact with the receiver for the Big Basin Water uh, company and on an ongoing basis and uh, they're working with the state offices to see how we can partner on the support. Um, 
But we are considering this deferral at this point uh, on a report back to the board. It's essentially for another month. Um, I would also like to see us respond more formally now that we have been in receipt of this request since uh, mid-November. Uh, so I would like to add, um, if we could give some additional direction to this item number 35, to have the staff send a letter to Big Basin Water, uh, the Big Basin Water Receiver, uh, acknowledging uh, the loan request and providing an update on our county's financial situation and letting them know we are still looking into what options we may have uh, to providing that support. Um, on item 53, uh, the Felton Pump Track is in my district. I want to thank uh, our Parks Department staff for working on this proposal, as well as uh, the Santa Cruz Mountain Trail Stewardship Team, who are parks leaders invited to be part of this project, given the expertise on uh, building these pump tracks. Um, this is um, a topic that has garnered a lot of attention in my district, and in particularly Felton, both in favor and opposed. Uh, but let me be, be clear that we have heard all of these viewpoints, and we have responded to many questions over the course of three public meetings that we've had. And now that we've arrived at a point that I, where I think we need to move forward, I'm going to be supporting this project. Uh, it's been vetted in our Parks Department, our County Council, our Planning Department, the final design uh, was also reviewed by our planning uh, team, uh, including our hydrologist related to the floodplain. We've had three public meetings, one by uh, the Parks Department and one by the, park, or the um, Parks Commission. Um, the pump tracks really have been successful features in other parts of the county, as been mentioned by some of my colleagues, uh, including two in Watsonville, several in Santa Cruz, and others in Live Oak and, and Aptos. They are well-established and well-used amenities, and I think it's going to be a real service. Uh, I think Felton would benefit from si situating this kind of uh, popular recreation spot for families in our beautiful covered bridge park, especially in a way that does not distract from the historic bridge or established community green space for festivals and other pro uh, events. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone in the community who provided this, their input, but I think this will be a real good asset to especially our young community in uh, the San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, and the, lastly, the item number 66, uh, the CSA uh, 9C, I'm very pleased uh, <clears throat> that's county service area 9C. Uh, pleased to see that the county's community infrastructure and development department was able to reach an agreement with the city of Scotts Valley regarding a shared formula for uh, sharing uh, CSA 9A funds. Uh, Scotts Valley property owners have been paying into the CSA 9C fund for many years and initially received um, solid waste services from the county for their contributions. Uh, the city has been providing uh, those services directly to its constituents for some time. And uh, this new agreement is an acknowledgement that more fair revenue sharing formula uh, was needed and is going to be established. And I was pleased that my office was able to take part in getting uh, the city of Scotts Valley to talk with the, our county representatives to make this a reality. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, briefly, um, Supervisor Cummings. I'll just go ahead and do it. Yeah, I did just want to make um, Supervisor Hernandez just pointed out to me that I didn't say the location of the Coast Commission meeting, but it'll be at the Dream Inn for those who are interested. And then I did want to just highlight with on, on number 28 that, that, that not only is this a ceasefire agreement, but it also asks for the return of all hostages by both sides. And I think that that has not been really emphasized, that this is not just talking about a ceasefire. It's, talk, it's also talking about releasing the hostages to both countries. So I just wanted to make sure folks we're clear on that uh, as part of this resolution as well. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. On item 18, the 2024 legislative priorities, I want to thank the CAO and staff. I think this does a really good job of crystallizing, frankly, some of the large challenges our county faces and that we need help from our state and federal legislators to address. I would certainly encourage uh, all those folks who are candidates for county supervisor this coming year to read through this list of legislative priorities because I think uh, it really demonstrates the work we have cut out for us. On item 27, the report from the Health Services Agency Recruitment and Retention Committee about hiring mental health client workers. Uh, I want to thank the Human uh, Services Agency and Personnel Department for this great report. I'm encouraged by the implementation of automated testing, uh, batch style interviewing, and other improvements in the hiring process that are allowing us to bring folks on board faster. 
and I look forward to the salary study in March of next year. On item 46, the Interim Behavioral Health Youth Crisis Diversion Project at the Emergency Department at Watsonville Community Hospital. I also want to thank uh, HSA staff and particularly behavioral health for getting this program set up. I've heard a lot over the last year about the challenges with with youth suffering from uh, mental health crises, uh, being you know in the hallways in the uh, emergency room in Dominican Hospital, and just not having adequate facilities there for them. And of course, we are moving towards uh, a really fantastic solution to this, which is the Children's Crisis Stabilization Center, um, really kind of in the next to the Sheriff Center, where we'll actually have sufficient beds for our community. Uh, but in the interim, we, we do need this solution. And I, uh, I just want to recognize behavioral health staff taking the time to set up this interim solution, even at the same time as we're planning a permanent solution. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Dominican Hospital for their partnership with this and, and helping to fund the interim solution. On item 49, reapproving the Crisis Now model program uh, and um, uh, an application to Mental Health Services Act Innovation Funds. Um, also want to thank the Behavioral Health Department for this item. Um, and I think that in, in some ways, even though we've already uh, reviewed this item as a board and, and approved it, um, and we're being asked to, to do so again, um, it helped to clarify for me that you know, of the over $5 million that will be spent on this program over the uh, coming years, but the majority of it is going to staff, uh, and that really only about 10%, less even, is going to sort of the uh, stri strategic plan portion of it, um, and that the majority is going to uh, it's county staff, salaries and benefits, um, and, and hiring another 12 people who provide support for dispatch and mobile crisis services. As I said before, this is something that I, I know our, our community desperately needs and has wanted for a long time, and I'm really excited to see this program moving forward. Finally, on item 28, the resolution in support of a permanent ceasefire in the war between Israel and Palestine. Uh, I certainly agree with many of the comments made today that we need compassion, justice, peace, that uh, there's interconnectedness between all our communities on the planet. Um, and of course, I'm incredibly saddened by the many images of people killed and maimed coming out of these, this war. However, as a county supervisor, it's my job to listen to all sides uh, and not make decisions about things that I don't have total clarity. And what I don't have clarity on is how a ceasefire would actually be operationalized. As has been said, this is a war not between Palestine and Israel, but between Hamas and Israel. And if we implement, if we ask for a ceasefire, are we going to have peace enforcers? Are we going to are we uh, asking for the interjection of, of of yet more bombs in order to keep the peace? I, I just don't know how we can ask um, for this when clearly one side is dedicated to the destruction of the other and will not listen to a ceasefire no matter what. I think moreover, what is clear is that if our county government takes a stand one way or another on this issue, it will drive division in our community over something that ultimately we don't have a lot of control over. And I don't think we can see our county government taking a side on this issue. Do I want compassion? Do we need compassion? Yes. I encourage, uh, I, I think if we want to prevent the collateral damage here in our own community, the right thing to do is uh, it's not try to suppose what the right answer is, uh, but to be kind to one another right here in this room and within this community. Send your resources and donations to those impacted by this war. Uh, so I'm going to be voting no on the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. I'll make uh, comments on two items. Item 46, I'd like to echo my colleague's appreciation. Um, I don't think you can overstate the amount of work that was put into this behind the scenes to uh, help with this interim behavioral health youth crisis diversion project at Watsonville Community Hospital. Um, it's going to serve, we estimate, at least 300 youth in our community over the next year and a half or so. Um, youth that in particular coming out of the pandemic are really struggling and needing resources. And this provides not just a resource, but it also provides it in a location where there's been an underinvestment historically in these kinds of resources. So I hope that this, uh, I appreciate my colleagues' uh, desire for additional direction on this to help amplify this information to other neighboring communities. And I hope um, that the broader community takes note in how these investments are happening throughout our community in advance of uh, the more permanent solution that will open um, in 2025. And in regards to uh, item 28, 
Um, I do appreciate Supervisor Cummings taking the extra time to describe the context by which he was bringing it forward. And I don't in any way, shape or form question the good intent of uh, bringing this item forward. Um, my challenge here is that no matter what the intention is, it's really impossible to take a finite position on this without alienating and dividing a significant portion of our community. It is true that we received hundreds of emails in support of such a resolution. Those emails also, a number of them, not all, but a number of them included language that was viewed as very hateful, hurtful, and inflammatory uh, by certain members of our community. And to me, that's, I don't think that was the intent, but it, that goes to show the complexity of the issue and the complexity with taking uh, a finite position on something like this. I mean, we're a board that prides ourselves on inclusivity and tolerance, and yet is being asked to take a position that clearly there's members in our community would view as uh, as hurtful and alienates and divides, which is not the ethos and the position of our community. It's literally not what our county seal says right there without prejudice. And I think that what we need to do in good conscience is work on efforts that aren't performative but efforts that when performative can also alienate or even more problematic. Um, there are many, I took the time and uh, did some outreach over the weekend when this item presented and asked uh, members of the community how they would perceive this, irrespective of the language. And I think that my colleague did a very good job trying to make the language as benign as possible. But because of the way that this is perceived internationally and nationally right now, there's really no way to craft something that isn't viewed as taking a side on the issue, that isn't viewed as dividing on the issue. And I don't think that that is the goal. It wasn't the goal of most of the speakers that spoke today. Uh, there were speakers who did, in my opinion, cross the line on uh, undertones of Islamophobia, and there were speakers who crossed the line on some of their comments on Israel that would be viewed as anti-Semitic. And we need to check the bias in our language and be careful in the bias of our language. And in particular, when the county is going to take an official stance on something, we need to be abundantly clear that we're not doing something that would alienate or divide members of our community. So for that reason, I, I can't support item 28 either. Uh, we'll move now toward a motion. We have a request for additional, uh, additional direction on 26. 35 and 46, and we have recorded no votes on item 28. Is there a motion for uh, the recommended actions with uh, the additional direction? I'll move to consent. Second. So we have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hernandez with the additional direction on those three items. And Madam Clerk, with the understanding of the three recorded no votes on item 28, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Chair, if I may, um, can I just receive some clarification on the additional direction on number 26? Absolutely. If I could only remember who it was that made the request for 26 additional direction. I think it might have been Supervisor McPherson, actually. Actually, it was, it was you. It was on the uh, Supervisor Cummings. It was on the probate. It was on the, uh, the probation officers on the... Um, oh. A report. It was an item report. 41. I believe it was 41. Not my mistake. I wrote down the wrong number. I apologize. So it was on item 41. Did you take down a note on that, Madam Clerk? And if not, I'll have Supervisor Cummings state. It was on uh, hey. What item was that? Chair, I believe this was uh, or Supervisor Cummings. I please the recommended action here or additional direction was to look at uh, retention bonuses if i may i think that the the action was to receive an update during the budget on how we're closing the gap with the vacancies mm -hmm. and then i just mentioned wanting to follow up with um county staff on the potential for retention pay so that's i just wanted to make that a public comment. okay so it's not an actual it's not direction. An actual, i apologize the direct so the direction would just be um during budget uh, to bring back information on how close we are to closing the gap for the vacancies with this as an incentive pay program. Okay. And you have for 35 and 46? Correct. We now have additional directions recorded for items 35, 41, and 46 
with no votes recorded for Supervisors McPherson, Koenig, and Friend on item 28. Yes, that's correct. I apologize for getting us confused on 26. If we could have a, a point, point of privilege, could you just repeat the um, additional direction for the other two items? Yes, we can. For item 46, um, I received, I recorded additional direction to send letters to local jurisdictions and school districts. And then for item 35, we received, we recorded additional direction to send the letter, um, a letter to the receiver acknowledging the request for funding, um, our county financial situation, and that we are still currently looking into options to fund it. Okay, thank you. And we'll direct the chair to write the letters just so that's clear. Okay, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Yes, and may I just receive who motioned and seconded? A motion from Supervisor Cummings, a second from Supervisor Hernandez. Supervisor Koenig. Aye, accepting 28. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson and Friend. Thank you. Thank you. That passes unanimously except for on item 28. It is 1040. We have a 1045 scheduled item. Um, uh, Mr. Pimentel, do you know how long the item would be anticipated to take on the fee schedule item? Okay, then we'll move forward with item seven and then we'll move uh, uh, with our 1045 schedule, which is zone five. Um, thank you all for coming this morning and for your respect and patience. Item number seven, if I may read it into the record, is a public hearing to consider a resolution approving amendments to the unified fee schedule and adopt a resolution confirming amendments to the unified fee schedule as outlined in the memo of the county administrative officer. We have the, uh, the board memo, the fee schedule updates, and a resolution confirming them. And we have Marcus Pimentel, our county budget manager. Mr. Pimentel, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Marcus Pimentel, your budget manager, thank you for that. Uh, our unified fee schedule is presented to you here today. Yeah. We come to this board twice a year in June and December for what are uh, cosmetic updates to the fee schedule. Generally, it's adjustments per CPI, adjustments per state code, or corrections and descriptions. Um, that is what are majority of the items here today. The examples uh, included in the resolution and attachments in the board packet include uh, updates to accessory dwelling units, uh, increases in fees by CPI consumer price index, for bulk recycled water, parkland and loop fees, and various other updates that are related to uh, state codes or healthcare or Medicare uh, calling changes. Uh, they were very simple this cycle as they were um, in the last time we were before your board in June. Um, with that, uh, the information is outlined in the board memo and presentation, and we have uh, departments here who are available for questions if there are any. Um, otherwise, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from board members before we open the public hearing? Uh, seeing none, we'd like to now open the public hearing. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on the unified fee schedule. Please feel free to step forward. Good morning. Welcome back. Morning. Good morning again, Becky Steinbrunner. I would like to ask as a member of the public that fees for CCU fire and uh, flood victim uh, rebuilding be reduced and uh, that fees planning fees for ADUs be reduced to help the county not only um, help residents who have experienced these disasters rebuild but also to help the county uh, meet our arena numbers with more affordable uh, permit fees for ADUs. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Is there anybody online? Chair, we do not have speakers online. All right, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for a motion. Move move. Recommended action. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor McPherson. If we could have a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Friend? Uh, and that passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Pimentel. Um, we will move on to item, uh, we'll move on to our 1045 item. I know it's gonna take a minute. Do we have anybody coming from, um, that's here from zone five as well that would like to step forward? I think we do. So we'll bring people forward. The slower you walk, I need you to kill 90 seconds, the better. <laughs> it's pretty fast, it's pretty fast. 
Um, and we'll have a 1045 scheduled item. I'll read it into the record and then I'll turn it over to the chair of zone five, which is Supervisor uh, Koenig. The item for our 1045 schedule, which is item 12, is the Board of Supervisors shall recess in order to permit the Board of Directors of Santa Cruz County Flood Control Water Conservation District to Zone 5 to convene and carry out a regular scheduled meeting. And we have the agenda board memo. Uh, I'll turn it over to Supervisor Koenig for our Zone 5 hearing meeting. We are close, but... Um... You can't look at that clock because that clock has been stuck uh, on that for quite some time. I promise you it's not 545. Okay. Correct. All right. Uh, that clock says 545, Dave. Yeah. It's 1044. Yeah, it's all right. We've got 60 seconds. Yeah. Okay, connection. All right, um, I will officially call to order the Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5 Board of Directors regular meeting. It is December 12, 2023, 10.44 a.m. and 30 seconds. Uh, clerk, if you could please call the roll. Certainly. Director Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Here. Friend? Here. McPherson? Here. Brown? Here. Balboni? Here. Oh, welcome. Feel free to come forward here. Uh, and Chair Koenig. Here. All right. Good. Um, since we have a quorum, are there any uh, additions or deletions to the consent or regular agendas? N no additional items. Okay. Uh, then we'll open oral communications. Does any member of the public wish to address us on items pertaining to the uh, Zone 5 Flood Control District? Thank you, Chair and Board Members. Uh, Matt Machado, Director of CDI and uh, your District Engineer for Zone 5. I do want to report uh, a change in our staffing today. I, I would have done this at the beginning of the board meeting, but I had a meeting conflict, so I showed up a few minutes late. Uh, it's unfortunate that I have to report this, uh, but our Assistant D District Engineer, Kent Edler, is leaving employment from the county at the end of December. It's a huge loss. Uh, so we're sad to see him go, but we're happy that he is on his way to a different career path, uh, slightly different, uh, not a lot different, but uh, he's been with the county for 21 years. He has been an amazing leader, an amazing manager, an amazing engineer for us. He's done so much good work. He's a pillar in our organization, and we're going to miss him greatly. So I felt it was important to let you all know that uh, he's made this decision and uh, December 29th will be his last day. So if you get an opportunity, wish him well, bid him farewell. Uh, we will miss him greatly. He'll stay living here. So hopefully he'll come back and visit us once in a while. But I just want to um, thank him for all of your, his years of service and uh, acknowledge him in front of your board today. Thank you for that. Thank you, Director Machado. We will definitely miss Assistant Director Edler. Anyone else wish to address us on uh, the Zone 5? Chair, we do have speakers on the Okay, line. go ahead. Call in user one. Your microphone's now available. I'd like um, for this body to call for a halt to geoengineering weather intervention operations that are a huge factor in the catastrophic weather that we are observing. And I'm quoting briefly Dane Wigington of Geoengineering Watch. He shades the drought deluge scenario is a hallmark of geoengineering. That's just in part. He is on KSCO Radio, 8 a.m. Saturday morning, that's 10 a.m. 80. And um, he states that um, climate engineering operations covering the planet like a layer of glass 
climate ecological collapse, 40 to 60 million tons annually of climate engineering particles are dispersed. Our system is collapsing in real time. Um, this is extremely serious and a factor that needs to be considered. And it's largely ignored when we're talking about floods and droughts, et cetera. He says climate engineering is a planetary death sentence. There's no limit to the deception and denial that's going on. Please call for a halt to weather intervention, geoengineering operations. That should be a step to Thank help you, our Garrett. county. We have no further speakers here. All right, then we'll proceed with the consent agenda, which is items five through eight. So any member of the board have questions or comments on the consent agenda? All right, seeing none. Um, do we have to take comment on the? Okay, any member of the public wish to comment on the consent agenda? Anyone online? All right, then I'll return it to the board for action on the consent agenda. I'll move approval of consent. Second. Motion by Director Brown, second by Director Hernandez. To approve the consent agenda, any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, will you please call the roll? Or, Director uh, uh, Hernandez? Yes. Cummings? Aye. Balboni? Friend? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Brown? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That uh, passes with one abstention. Move on to the regular agenda, item nine, which is to approve amendment to agreement with Schaff and Wheeler Consulting Civil Engineers, revising the scope of work, extending the contract term, and increasing the compensation. Approve the transfer of $68,098 from the capital reserve funds into the master plan update funds and take related actions outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. And does our district engineer have a report on this? Good morning. Yes, thank you. Uh, the master plan update is... The project itself is almost completed, assessing the condition and capacity of the facilities in the zone. Uh, seeing the results and the impacts of the storms last year, or this, this calendar year, uh, we discussed the need for being prepared for storms to fix our problems. We discussed the need with the city of Capitola, and we, we thought it's, it's the right time to expand on the project itself and go uh, seek uh, funding assistance from the citizens in the community. So we are proposing to change the scope of work to add that task uh, and to go for vote for Prop 218 process. At the same time, removing a task that we felt is not necessarily related to impervious area impact fees because we already collect the fees and we cannot collect it for redevelopment projects, which uh, the fee can be collected once in the life of the uh, of the impervious area fee. So we dropped the task and we added this task for Prop 18 assessment to hopefully get sustainable funding to fix our problems. All right, thank you, Ms. Fatui. Are there comments or questions from board members? All right, seeing none, any member of the public wish to comment on this item? Seeing no one here in chambers, is there anyone online? No speakers online, Chair. All right, then uh, we'll just say, look, forward very much to the release of this draft uh, master plan and to moving into the um, public input phase of this. Of course, it is a very important issue. Um, as as we know from last year, stormwater and drainage affect us all. Uh, be more than we realize until it's uh, too late. So um, with that, is there a motion? Second. All right, motion from uh, D Director McPherson, second by Director Hernandez. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, will you please uh, roll call vote? Certainly. Director McPherson? Aye. Friend? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. Brown? Aye. And Balboni? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. That brings us to the end of our agenda, and the uh, meeting is adjourned. And I'll hand it back to Chair Friend. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Uh, we'll move on to item eight.
to consider a presentation on collective or results evidence-based investments or four annual report for fiscal year 22-23 and report back on community engagement, provide direction for prioritization for the next cycle of the RFP development and direct the human services department for an honor before April 30th, 2024, the draft RFP is outlined in the memo of the director of human services. Okay. The agenda uh, board memo, the investments uh, annual report for 22 and 23 and the core community engagement process and the prioritization methodology. With us, we have uh, Randy Morris, our director of human services and Kimberly Peterson, our assistant director. I'll uh, kick it off to you, uh, Director Morris. Thanks for being here. Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, Chair Friend. Good morning, board members. And we have a very long agenda today. Um, and welcome to those here in chambers and listening in. Um, and a special recognition to the city of Santa Cruz. want to remind everybody that this is a braided funding um, discussion where the city of Santa Cruz participates in this. And uh, Kimberly and I will be in front of the city council this afternoon in partnership with the city manager's office. Um, before we display the PowerPoint and go through a formal presentation, I just want to say a couple of remarks. Um, CORE is an acronym which stands for Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Practice. I also want to say something that's become clear to me in my almost four years here is direction from this board um, before my time almost a decade ago was to develop a framework to think about how to maximize limited funds to achieve collective impact and also to look at a way to ask for results to be um, reviewed based on sort of a more common way of collecting data from our community members. And so this led to um, the creation of this framework called CORE. And I want to make sure to distinguish that as a movement, which a number of CBOs and our city partners, the city of Santa Cruz, and we in conversations with our CIO's office looking at our next strategic plan, see as a framework to think about how to organize our funding and the way we track data and report on data. That is part of and distinct from how we do an actual competitive procurement or the request for proposal. And I just want to name both um, are in play right now, which we'll talk about more today. And finally, uh, a value of Santa Cruz County, which I really appreciate, is that we always focus on continuous quality improvement and applying lessons learned for every step of our work when we put limited money out to the community for consideration. Um, I also want to share with the board and with those listening uh, something that I shared when Kimberly and I were last in front of you in April when we got direction to return today uh, to discuss what we'll go through today, that the amount of money we're talking about that will be in the next uh, procurement cycle is approximately six plus million dollars, a million plus dollars of city general fund and five plus million dollars of your general fund. That six million dollars represents about one percent of the amount of county money that is spent to help the most vulnerable in our community through the county health agency, the county human services department, and all the contracts we um, manage. And so I just want to put in perspective, this is funding that is completely at your discretion from its general fund. But I think it's important to remind the ability for it to impact and change is important and meaningful for each CBO, but it is 1% of the overall $600 million of funding that is spent to help people in our community. So, um, the last comment before we pull up the PowerPoint, um, I want to remind your board, you have a lot of things on every single agenda today being certainly an example of that. We are here today because when we were in front of you in April, that was to share a comprehensive lesson learn review about what worked well and what were the pain points of the last RFP cycle. And we had recommended that we really sequence the next series of events thoughtfully and carefully and staged over time so we aren't rushed in making these very important decisions. And your board approved a framework and a timeline, which included us coming today for what we'll talk about today. So I just want to make sure this is directly linked to previous direction from your board. So with that said, if I could ask the clerk of the board to pull up the PowerPoint and um, we'll kind of walk through what we'll discuss today. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, this is briefly the agenda. We're going to summarize the recommended actions. Why we like to do this for something like this is to make sure those listening in and you as our board understand the very specific actions that you're voting on today. We are next going to speak about the annual report. We are just 
finished the first full year of the three-year procurement cycle. So we have a number of contracts that have delivered a number of services to the community. They all submitted their reports to us. And we have attached, which is in attachment A, a, a summary of that annual report. And we will discuss that briefly today because that helps us think about what worked, what didn't work, and how is the contracts going today. We will then speak about a pretty robust community engagement process we went through since we were last in front of you in April. That was direction from your board to get input from our community members to help us think together and lift that up to you to share with you what the thinking is about what the next RFP should look like. And I certainly invite members of uh, the community who participated to share anything during public comment. But this all leads to finally the beginning of a set of opportunities we are going to have to be in front of you to do what you asked us to do. And not to misquote or overly summarize, but essentially, can we please have the hard discussions and ask us as elected officials to make the hard decisions to where to prioritize and focus this money because we don't have enough of it to fund every good idea. And the request was, can we as staff figure out a way to come to the board well before awards are uh, recommended next time to have more input from you as our elected officials and decision makers to make prioritizations. And then we as staff can implement and integrate those in the next procurement cycle. So that is really where this all leads to today, a first staff recommendation. So if you can go to the next slide. So here are the three recommended actions today. One is the standard accept and file of the materials. The next is really what I want you to focus on. We have staff recommendations in front of you. And we are seeking direction from you because what direction we get from you today will be what we build into the next draft RFP. And we will detail um, in our presentation other opportunities we see that you have as our electeds to further give us more refined direction as we get closer. And then finally, and as Chair said, friend said as an introduction, for us to return in April, which is part of the already approved board timeline to play out between now and the next procurement. So next slide. And this is where I'll turn this over to Kimberly, who walked through uh, the annual report that is in materials of attachment A. Good morning, board. So as Randy mentioned, um, continuous improvement is important, as well as applying lessons learned. And both of those have been integral to the core process from its inception, inception to the present. Annually, HSD has provided a report on the core funded programs. And this year's report builds on prior feedback and lessons learned and moves us closer to being able to see the collective impact and results across the four programs with a multifaceted equity lens. This year, there is more detailed data collection, including on the number of unduplicated people served, disaggregated by race, race and ethnicity, age, language, and location as previously requested by the board, and the overall structure allows for easier measurement and analysis across programs. A results-based accountability framework was utilized for all core programs, which tracks how much was accomplished, how well were the services carried out, and is anyone better off? This year's report also includes a description of how each organization internally practices equity. For challenge and success, challenges and successes, most programs did encounter some type of challenge their first year. Some common challenges were with staffing, data collection for client demographics, and working through the impacts of local disasters. Despite challenges, there, were also notable, there was also notable progress. Core programs served almost 107,000 people last year. 6,000, almost 6,000 more than the contracted goals indicated. Some level of demographic data was reported across all programs, allowing us to see who specifically was served. And 94% of surveyed participants reported that they were very satisfied or satisfied with the program services. Collectively, 81% of the better off goals were met across all core programs. And lastly, thanks to the creation of an online reporting portal, core programs submitted their annual report and data electronically, which streamlined the data collection process and reporting and enabled us to include a brief two-page snapshot for each program as a part of the annual report. And as Randy mentioned, though this is only 1% of the funding that goes to critical services, the ability for us to begin to see this level of data 
across various programs will there allow us to better gauge the impact of core funding and further analyze potential gaps and needs. For community engagement, well, we are just off the first year of the last round of contracts and into the second year, uh, into the second year, we are moving quickly to prepare for the next RFP, continuing to apply what we learned through experience, formal and informal feedback during the last RFP and the lessons learned process we presented you, to you last April. We conducted nine community engagement sessions and provided access to an online survey. The intent of the engagement was to discuss opportunities for improvement, receive general feedback, and explore the ways the county could prioritize core funding, building off of the pain points that emerged during the last round of funding. Throughout the engagement sessions, common areas of alignment emerged. Regarding data and transparency, one of the things that we had heard following the last RFP was that people wanted to know what the priorities for funding were. And during the community engagement, there was alignment that data should continue to be a driver in the core process. We also heard that prioritization should include a broad set of data points across the core conditions, and there should be transparency around the purpose and priorities for funding from the outset. On equity, the last RFP was targeted at addressing, at addressing inequity, and the collective feedback received through community engagement pointed towards support for continuing to center equity in the process. We also asked a handful of more technical questions on the structure of the, of the RFP. During the last RFP, there was a limit to how much any single organization could apply for, and we heard that this should be continued. Um, during the last round, the ability to leverage funds was not weighted in the scoring process, and we heard feedback that it should not be prioritized for this next round either. People felt that both of these parameters created more opportunity for the smaller and mid-sized organizations with less infrastructure to compete and allowed for more distribution of funds. During the last round, any agency could apply for any size grant, small, medium, large, or the targeted impact. And there was alignment and feedback that during the next RFP, large agencies should be restricted from applying for small grants. Small grants should be an opportunity for small, less resourced organizations to receive limited funding. Past contract performance was not a factor in the last RFP, and the feedback was that should not be included as a factor in scoring future applications either. Some felt it may give an advantage to organizations that were previously funded um, versus providing a clean slate each round of RFP. There were also a few areas without alignment. We heard interest in having the purpose of core funding be clarified and whether it was for new innovative programs or traditional safety net services, but there was no alignment on what that should be. And acknowledging the definition of safety net can be seen as evolving over time. No alignment emerged regarding how to prioritize funding, such as by geography, specific populations, or core condition. And there was no alignment in whether a portion of funds should be held for distribution by the elected officials following the recommended awards. And while not noted on the slide, we also heard general feedback that people wanted to see the scoring rubric in advance, that there be an increased diversity in the review panels, and that the application process be simpler. We do not have specific recommendations for you on these items today though we are tracking them for the RFP development, and once direction regarding prioritization is received, we will integrate these themes um, into the draft RFP for your review when we come back. We do, of course, welcome additional direction on these if you choose to provide it today. So regarding prioritization, considering the collective feedback regarding prioritization and the support for continuing to center equity, and the use of data, we tried to identify a data-driven approach to how limited funds could be prioritized. We landed on an approach that uses the core conditions of well-being as a foundation, and then considers a representation of available data reports that connect to the eight core conditions. And we combined that with a high-level analysis of the county budget to determine where the current county general funds are directed relative to the core conditions. 
The data reports on their own do not lead to a clear funding priority that HSD can recommend because there are needs everywhere. However, the combination of available data plus high-level funding analysis completed thanks to HSD's data team in partnership with our CAO and budget liaison allows us to use a data-driven approach to prioritization, which will incrementally get us closer to greater collective impact and results with very limited funds. And I'll turn it back to Randy. Okay, thank you, Kimberly. So I wanna uh, remind uh, the audience watching that this is a very small snapshot of what is included in attachment C. And just at the risk of repeating what Kimberly said, I wanna just remind everyone we were asked to come forward to you as staff to ask well before the RFP was released for you as the board to give us your priorities based on your values and to do what we could in partnership with community to ask you to make hard decisions now as opposed to after the rewards come forward when it feels like it's sort of a little too late. So as Kimberly said, this picture is in the attachment. Thank you for the CAO's office and our team who looked very closely and did a lot of work to look at the county's $1.2 billion budget and broke it out thoughtfully to see where is the county currently contributing to these core conditions. More importantly, then peeled back and said which portion of this budget is general fund because most of the programs at least we run in human services and health are heavily leveraged by state and federal funds. And what this clearly showed us is there are three core conditions which are shown in the yellow highlight in this picture where we do not invest a lot of general fund. Uh, they are thriving families, lifelong learning and education, and stable, affordable housing and shelter. This shows us that of the eight core conditions, there are three where we do not have a lot of general fund. And in response to your board and the community's request to look at some data to perhaps give you a window to where we think you could have the most targeted impact, we are recommending as our primary recommendation number one today to have the RFP written based on these three core conditions being the priority to then do what the community asked us, which is please let us know up front what the values are, what the priorities are of this board. And I wanna say a little bit why we made these choices. About 50 plus percent of current core contracts already are focused on these three core, three core conditions, which raise the question, well, what are the other core conditions and what are those funding? And they are predominantly in two areas and I wanna break down a little bit so the community can hear this and you can understand if you accept this recommendation, what this means. One of the uh, core conditions that has a lot of funding today is economic security. This, there are a lot of community-based organizations who focus on addressing poverty and self-sufficiency. And I do not see in our staff analysis that anything by accepting these recommendations would prohibit or interfere with agencies that focus on addressing poverty from applying in the thriving families uh, core condition. Any family that's suffering in poverty is not thriving and there's nothing in conflict with current agencies who have missions to focus on poverty and currently got awards by focusing on economic security to prohibit them from submitting applications to say families do not do well, they are not thriving when they're suffering in poverty. So we do not see that to be a conflict. The second area where a lot of core, core funding is about a quarter of it is in the area of health and wellness. If you accept this recommendation, we recognize that we would be drafting an RFP and the CBOs who currently have funding under health and wellness would have to f find one of the other three. Because of this, we consulted in human services with healthcare leadership and we had a conversation about their thoughts about this and we did not bring this recommendation forward until we had their support. And I wanna break down a little bit for you to hear and the community to hear why. First, of the diversity of programs that the healthcare agency runs, one getting a lot of attention of late, rightly so, at a state and federal level is mental health. It was discussed earlier. There is a lot of reform activity happening at the state to reform the way mental health is funded, and there are new opportunities for mental health community-based organizations to apply for funding under the initiative CalAIM which will go live in the future, and in consult with the healthcare agency because this new door is open, and because we are being asked collectively staff to make a recommendation to you to consider where to target the limited general fund, given there is other opportunities to apply for mental health programming through CBOs, that was one factor. And the other is 
as I mentioned in the economic security area, where there is no conflict with having their submit their applications under healthy families. The same applies to health and wellness. Any family who has somebody suffering from a health condition and is not doing well, we do not see a similar, we do not see a conflict. But to make sure we are very careful and intentional if this recommendation is approved and how we draft the RFP, which we'll bring to you and it will be public, the healthcare agency, and thank you to their leadership, agreed to work with us on the drafting of the RFP to make sure there is nothing we unknowingly do to um, limit the ability of the many wonderful health agencies in this community from applying it under this, this structure. So uh, this leads to the next slide, which is the final slide. And I wanna take a minute to speak to what is in front of you. This is a picture of what we brought forward to you in April and that you approved as the next series of events. The reason the numbers one, two, three, and four are here is we thought very hard about how much this program generates and how complicated this is and how hard it is to make these decisions. So we are intentionally in front of you with an iterative recommendation to have today be just recommendation number one, but we see point two, point three, and point four as future public hearings where you will, and we likely will be asking you to give us further direction. And we are trying to limit and chunk out the decision-making point so we don't come in front of the big, huge, complicated ecosystem of direction, but do this in stages. So today, as it says at the bottom of the slide, is to support our recommendation to go back and draft an RFP, which focuses on three core conditions. And of course, if you give us any additional direction today, we'll incorporate that as well. However, for your consideration, when we come to you no later than the end of April, and we have a draft RFP, that is another opportunity for your board and the city council later to give us further direction, which we can then incorporate before releasing the RFP based on anything that has played out in the mass last months. I wanna particularly highlight number three. This was something we had planned during the last RFP cycle, but unfortunately and literally, the Omicron variant interfered with what here is number three. We had planned to come to your board during the last RFP cycle with a summary of all the applications, where they landed, and ask the board and the city council behind to say, based on this, and before we as staff come back to you with recommended wards, do you have any final direction for us? Because there are so many applications recommending do wonderful things. What do you want us to focus on? So we could then incorporate that in the final recommended awards. That was lost because of the Omicron variant. Your board approved this timeline, which pushed forward six full months, the process to create more space to have these hard conversations. And if we you approve this today, we will back in front of you for an RFP in the spring. And then as important, at least as I see it, we will then come to you before we recommend any awards and detail and summarize everything that's been submitted, not by agency name, but by themes and summaries and ask for more direction from you because we anticipate there will be more applications to do more things than we have money. And we will then incorporate that into coming back to you with final recommended awards. And then that's number four. This is your money. You, of course, still retain um, authority to change any recommended awards at that point. But if we do this right, we think we will have addressed some of those pain points from the past and incorporated your direction every step of the way so the recommended awards are more aligned with what is important to you. With that said, I, my, my final comments, I don't wanna repeat everything that Kimberly said, but I wanna be very clear that we are very aware there are certain important issues to your board and the community partners who gave us feedback that are not in the recommendations today. And Kimberly mentioned a number of them. If you give us direct, additional direction today, we will come back and incorporate them to RFP. But there are a few that were not named that I just want to point out that are important to us and we are tracking. Number one, how to operationalize equity. That's equity is an easy word. But I want to remind everybody what we did last time because it the word equity generates a lot of feelings and a lot of opinions. What we did very intentionally in consult with the community was we said, you are the ones delivering the service. You are the ones working with families and vulnerable people in this community. We would like to have the RFP be one where you tell us what are the inequities you see in the work you do, and then submit in your application how you will address that inequity. I heard mostly positive feedback from the community saying, thank you, government, for not telling us and putting us in a box. 
The one exception to that was for the targeted impact grant. We focused and the community supported this on racial inequities. That did not prohibit anybody from submitting an application saying, I want to focus on the Latinx population that is aging or that is disabled or that is anything else. But it was a request to focus on racial inequities. But all the other applications, the CBOs told us what the inequities were. Second, your board directed us last time to carve out one grant from competitive application, and that was the local meals program to line it up with the local AAA. We know and we're mindful that we don't have any specific recommendations. We welcome any additional direction. We anticipate this conversation will play out if the board and the city council have consensus on other carve outs. Just want to name that we're aware there's no staff recommendation. And finally, I do want to uh, highlight something that uh, Kimberly told me, and if we are going to walk the talk of equity, we got some very meaningful, reasonable feedback, particularly from South County, that spoke to us about the way the panels were assembled. We used a conflict of interest policy, which unintentionally, but seemed to end up landing on ruling out a representative sample of participants to be on panels and we will work very hard between now and then and when panels are assembled to make sure we incorporate those lessons learned to make sure the panelists are representative of the full community. We heard that feedback. We were tracking that feedback and we'll sure to apply that going forward. So with that said, we turn it to the board for any questions or public comment or wherever you'd like to go next. Thank you. Thank you, Director Morris. Are there questions or comments from board members before we open up the community? Um, go ahead, Supervisor Cummings. Okay, yeah, I'd like to make a couple. Oh, excuse me. Um, I, I just really want to thank the Human Services Department for its solid report and uh, for your work to engage the communities uh, regarding their feedback about the core investments. Um, this has been controversial since we, we put it in place, but as we discussed in last week's uh, board meeting, the county can be incredibly proud of core and the way we implement it. Uh, as I mentioned then, I think last week, um, that CSAC uh, gave one um, of its challenge awards. Uh, it honored 13 programs throughout uh, 58 counties with 389 entries. And this was one of them that they said was outstanding and the way we are doing it. Um, I think that really says a lot uh, for the the success and really the way we're doing this program. And today's report shows the county's commitment to directing our limited core funding to effective uh, data-driven programs. Um, it's impressive, I think, as was mentioned, above of more than 107,000 responses. They were either very satisfied or satisfied with what we are doing with core. And I appreciate the HSD's um, hard work to ensure uh, that the online survey community engagement and listening sessions included community-based organizations uh, providing direct services and coalitions, such as the area agency um, uh, on advisory council. Um, the community's feedback is um, critical uh, to establishing the core priorities that you mentioned, the framework for the next round of funding, but we also need to recognize that the amount of funding is so limited. Uh, the county can't meet every expectation articulated in the community engagement process. The goal is really to have uh, the best collective equitable impact of services we can fund. We have hundreds, close probably to a thousand of uh, community service nonprofit agencies in this county, most of them small, but uh, we're going to, uh, we're trying to address the biggest needs that we can with the limited, uh, limited funding we have, seven, five million in the county and one million dollars in the city. So I encourage members of the, um, of the public to read this uh, full report that was put out on the core investments annual report. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, Director Morris and the human services uh, services staff for helping the board make this evidence based decision uh, for our core investments. Uh, it's a hugely successful program. We've made improvements to it. You have listened to people and made those improvements. And I look forward to implementing the second year of this program uh, when we get to it next year. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for this report. I did have a question um, related to the new prioritization of programs, and so I'm just wondering, based on the staff recommendation, how will the prioritization of these new categories impact currently funded programs? 
um, largely because in the last round we saw that um, you know the applications that were recommended resulted in certain um, organizations not receiving funding, which then had impacts to those organizations. And so I'm just curious if there's a way for us to better understand how changing this categorization is going to impact some existing programs. I have two quick comments. One is I want to mindful what happened last time because of the crises, the pandemic, the Omicron variant, the decision got made so late, the cur current providers had no real lead time. And we found one-time funding to create three months of bridge. This under board direction of an approval and city council approval has been moved up six months. I know that's not directly on point, but I want to make sure you know some of the public um, procurement cycles align with how we have now. So we have way more lead time for the agencies who if your board accepts the process and accepts the awards and certain lose funding, there's way more lead tied to transition built into this process. Number two, um, in full transparency, um, the way the current core contracts are organized is applicants had to uh, pick one core condition, but they were allowed to submit others because the core framework is an interconnected framework and many of them applied under one but are doing other things. We track the data on what they applied for it's hard to track the second and third. So with that said, about two thirds of the current um, programs would fit within this framework without issue. Further, and we haven't got to this now, but there was a lot of technical assistance available last time and we plan to apply it this time. Current CBOs who got an award in a different core contract, as I said about economic security and health and wellness, we see at least on an original review, ample opportunity to organize their applications to be within these core conditions because this is predominantly where most of our agencies deliver service. So that said, I don't think there is any way around the hardest issue, which I believe is the subtext of your question, which is procurements are a restart. And I think that's part of what the pain point has been here is agencies had funding for 30 years without change. A competitive procurement creates change, which by definition, these people get contracts and people lose contracts. And I think that pain point, there's no way around it unless you upend the whole process. Building in the six months lead time, having the three focus areas based on where we're not very well invested. There are still lots of other contracting opportunities outside of core where CBOs can deliver service and currently do have contracts. So I hope that's responsive, but please let me know if uh, that answered it, if you have more questions. Okay answer my question to some extent. Um, I guess one of the things you touched on earlier was the fact that, um, you know, as the state and federal government changes diff the way different programs can be funded, some of the work that was funded previously by CORE can actually get funded by some other source of funding. So I think, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on it right now, but the CalAIM, you know, being able to see funding from CalAIM go to something else. So I think that that's important for tracking because if there's a way to fund something under core with that funding source, which could then mean that we could fund other programs that maybe wouldn't have received funding otherwise, I think that's a good way to try to help us maximize our funding over time as we have this program kind of roll out. Um, I guess, I don't know if now's a good time, but I do have some comments to make, um, just having gone through the report. Um, one thing that I think is really challenging, but um, what's really going to come down to is the applications that get submitted, which is why I think is really important for the public and for the board to see what programs are being um, considered, because I think it'll help us better understand the gaps these programs are trying to fill and the gaps that currently exist. So I think that's actually something that would help be beneficial to us as this program unfolds is really understanding what are the current gaps in our system. And just as a brief example, you know, if we um, look at childcare as as an example of programs, I mean, that's something that we saw cuts to last time. We'd see, I hear from many people that that's probably one of the biggest priorities in our community that we need more access for people to have childcare. And so I'm just using that as an example, to, because if there's, if that's a gap and we have more funding and some of those organizations can leverage funding, whether it's a state or federal level to expand those services, I think that's important. Um, versus, you know, the county is getting a lot of money for homelessness right now. So would we want to divert, you know, a huge chunk of core funding to homelessness? It's like, well, we're being successful at securing funding from the state. So maybe this isn't the right source. So I just put that out there so we can really start to consider what are the gaps? What are the funding opportunities? And if there's no way for there to be state or federal funds, maybe those types of programs should fall under core and be considered and prioritized in the application process. Mm -hmm. Chair friend. 
is it appropriate to make comment to uh, an board comment? Yeah, they, sure. So I think a way, if I heard you correctly, to um, move forward on your what I'm hearing is your request to make sure the board understands the applications. I want to highlight and repeat what I said before is the build in of coming to your board and the city council behind you with a summary of the recommendations will then lift up for you what the trends are. And you mentioned childcare, for example. You would have ample opportunity either at the RFP release or I think at that point to say, wait, the landscape has changed, the state budget is out now, and I, if the board recommends, you could target us to say, come back with recommended awards that focus here, focus there. So that's, I think, one way to operationalize that. And I would see, perhaps if you agree with this, when we bring the RFP forward, you can give us any direction at that time about what you want in the staff report that summarizes the applications. So that's number one. And then I also wanted to say, um, mindful, I was kind of careful about how much to say about this, but it, it so happened the data led us to these three core conditions. But those three core conditions do fit with a lot of what we've been hearing from the community. They include child care. You mentioned homeless funding, and you and I have talked about this, but I want to nuance this. There is a lot of federal and state funding for various homeless programs, but there's no federal or state funding for emergency shelters or warming centers. Or So there's some nuance in there, but 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 the, by prioritizing based on we're not very well invested in emergency shelter and affordable housing, there's ways to parse that out under your direction. The family, um, Thriving Families also really lines up well with a recent um, Kimberly and Health and First Five talked about the Thrive by Five initiative, and there's lots of underinvestment in there. There's a lot of prioritization in this county about immigrant families and undocumented immigrants, and also the master plan for aging, helping people who are disabled and aging age in place with their families fits very well with the healthy family. So there are lots of um, meaningful, important priorities that have already been discussed publicly that fit well within these three buckets. And I think from your previous question, if this is approved, it doesn't limit. And I think that opportunity to share the details will be when you can give us final direction to make those choices rather than share the recommended awards and have concerns about what, what got voted by the panel members. Great. Um, just a couple of the comments, um, just based on reading the report. Um, I do, you know, in terms of um, what this funding should go towards, I do think that this money should go to both existing services and for new programs, and that was brought up in the report. Um, I think it would be good to include in the application how funding can be used to leverage more funds. Um, I think if, if this program, the idea is we're trying to maximize funding and services, knowing whether a, an organization can leverage small pools of money to to expand services in our community, I think is really important. And it's not to say that that means that we're going to select that organization. I think it just gives us the information we need when we're making our decisions on, you know, what the, what's being proposed and how local funds can be used to maximize other funds. It also allows us to understand whether or not we can you know, we don't use core funds as their way to supplement the funding with another source of funding. And so I think that it's just good to have that information. Um, I think that if organizations have received funding in the past and are applying for new funds, we should get some information on how um, the funding was spent and what were the outcomes from the programs that they provided, because we want to, I mean, it's a level of accountability on our end that if we're giving organizations funding, we want to know how, you know, how those programs are, are actually turning out. Um, I don't, I think there should be a cap on the funding, but I think we should express that, you know, there's a priority on maximizing funds and services across diverse agencies. I mean, if, if an agency tries to apply for all the funds, you, they're likely not going to get it. But I think it is interesting for us to know what folks are applying for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we don't fund them, are there, again, are there other ways that we can find funding to support what they're um, trying to do? But really expressing that the goal behind this is to maximize funds across you know, diverse agencies, I think is really important for us to um, express. Um, I think it would be really important to have information on the application that um, identifies what the agency size is and what the agency's budget is to help, you know, define the size of the agency, which was brought up in the, in the, um, in the report. And um, there should also, it also be important to know whether a grant writer was contracted um, in the RFP process. This for us is, you know, we know that larger organizations, they're going to write much better 
grants if they can hire a grant writer versus a small organization that may have to rely on their existing staff to write the grant. And the reason why I say this too is because in the last round, it was kind of best application wins. Well, if you're able to afford a grant writer, you're going to have a much better application than someone who can't, or maybe not. But I think it's important to kind of know what access folks these organizations had to having someone who could either professionally write a grant or that they have to write the grant on their own. I think that is an equity issue um, that can be that we can help address um, if that information is clear. Um, and then um, lastly, I think the supervisors and public should have access to the applications when they come available so that we can read the applications and know what's being offered and the public can weigh in, you know, more broader members of the public can weigh in. And then um, and especially having the board weigh in on the application selection process. And I know that you had mentioned that because of Omicron, we didn't get access to the applications last time, but that was a big sticking point for me why I had such a huge issue with this because I couldn't read over the, app, the scoring. I couldn't read over what was being proposed by the different organizations. And that really um, had a huge influence on, on why I was pretty upset with how things went. And so I'll just leave my comments there, but just wanted to put that out since you all asked for our input and this might be, you know, this is, one of our opportunities to, to publicly kind of present to you all the concerns that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Oh, sorry, Supervisor Hernandez. Quick questions about criteria, the rubric, and kind of the methodology of it. But I'm glad we're trying, or hopefully we're trying to make it more accessible to smaller and mid-sized CBOs. I know that the equity is part of the uh, criteria or the rubric, right? Um, you know, obviously that's race, but um, are we looking at economic disparity as part of equity and uh, like sense tracks? And if so, are we doubling like on the rubric, the points, if there is both, right? Uh, both economic disparity and, and racial, right? Um, are we doubling down the points for the rubric, the rubric points, right? To award that, that agency. Uh, and my second question is with awardees, are we tracking the level of service that they're doing and and tracking that they meet the level of service they're saying they, they they're doing and if so are we um using that data for future awards um at least internally um for part of the rubric well we just whispered i'll take the first to really take the second um and this is how I'm tracking your first question about equity. I want, I'm at the risk of repeating what I said. We wrote the last RFP in response to community feedback that how to operationalize equity is very complicated. And there was a request to have us not impose upon the community what we defined as equity. So we specifically invited the CBOs. You tell us to your question, mm -hmm. you, as I heard it. You tell us what inequities you see based on whatever metric, poverty levels, region, ethnicity. You tell us what inequities you see and how, if awarded this contract, you would help to uh, decrease those inequities. So we created a wide berth. The second part of that is how did we score that? And one of the things that we can apply as a lesson learned from a pain point in the past is we are so rushed. There's so much going on. When the RFP was released, the scoring rubric, which showed how we plan to wait and score things, was not part of it. We plan to release that all as once. So for me, if I'm understanding your question, you would have an opportunity when we come forward to you with the next RFP drafted based on this as the first run. If you Then we would write all this in and we would have the scoring rubric. We would show what our recommendation is for how to weigh things. And you would have a chance to weigh in and say you accept that or you want us to change it. So that's how we, I think we would get at what I'm hearing your question to be. And then you had a second question, which Kimberly nodded. She'll answer, so I didn't track it. Uh, so regarding what we're doing with the uh, with the the progress reports from each of the CBOs programs, um, we are our general approach to the core programs. All of them is that we want to see them be successful. So this past year was the first year for some programs. Some programs that was um, funding to con continue something they were already doing. And for programs that were not um, fully meeting um, any area of what they had planned to do, we just work with them and check in on, you know, what, um, how it's going, if they're, you know, how, what approaches they're taking to try and um, achieve success. And so what you're seeing in this report is the year one snapshot. Next year, we'll intend, we will provide the same type of snapshot and same in the third year. And our hopefully, 
over time, we'll see that any program that is not um, fully achieving its goals currently, that they'll work towards that over time. Uh, does that help answer the question? Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first off, I want to just appreciate all the data that's being provided to us today. It's really great to um, you know, honestly, uh, to know all of the programs that we're funding better based on the results, based on the testimonials from people who are benefiting from these programs, um, and uh, you know, have data that we can com even compare programs between one another. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I one question I guess to start off with. One of the big issues we experienced last time um, was kind of getting back to what you mentioned of that. This is just the core program is just really 1% of all of the money the county spends. And really the kind of one of the cleanup actions, if you will, after the last core awards were to look at some of the uh, applicants who did not get funding and see how we could fund them uh, through the other 99%, right? Um, through contracts uh, to deliver their services that we we were you know honestly seeking um, through other channels. So. It sort of thought of like, could we streamline the application process a little bit? Maybe identify some folks who would be good uh, candidates for those other contracts, the other 99% uh, early on rather than you know, after the awards are being uh, made or, or determined. You know, could we have some kind of letter of intent process um, where we just get a sense of who's planning on applying and we can uh, reply to them and say, you know, that's great. But we actually have these other opportunities if you consider just uh, responding to this RFP that's coming out from HSD in whatever, a couple of months. I, I want to share a couple of ways I'm processing your comment. One is uh, you never know what the budget is going to be like at the point in time we're in front of the board again for recommended awards. And it's predicted to be a very difficult budget season. And just not that this was directly what you're saying, but I think every time we come forward and if recommended awards are approved and certain agencies doing good work are not funded because their application wasn't ranked high enough, there's always opportunity to ask the departments, is there other funding sources? And we did find one funding source that was very categorically restricted that we repurposed because we had some one-time money to help one of the agencies have one-year bridge funding. So that can obviously be part of something we do. Number two, we don't talk about this a lot publicly, but we do and we can continue to make sure community-based organizations are aware of the opportunities for us to partner and co-apply. And since the last RFP cycle, somewhat informed by some of these discussions, we did co-apply with a couple CBOs for some state and federal grants as public and private to try to help. And then I think number three, um, there is a broader effort going on with our community-based organizations looking at how we contract with them. And I think there's space for us to continue to have that conversation to make sure they're aware. And they're very aware. And I think the smaller agencies have less infrastructure of funding opportunities that aren't just county, but sometimes state and federal. And I think we can, in those conversations, there's already a lot of like, how do we contract? How do, are we uniform? So in that space, we can continue this conversation with the CBOs to make sure they're aware and we often get asked to sign support letters to state and federal and philanthropic grants and we're happy to do that um, particularly targeting those who have lost funding for whatever reason so i hope that's responsive it's going to be a difficult budget year i don't know if we'll have that one-time money available but if we do i think we'd certainly have that conversation then all right so it sounds like it is somewhat part of the discussion the fact that there's other funding opp or opportunities or channels available and um, that's good. I'm just encouraged to, you to continue to incorporate it and make that part of the um, outreach process and discussion with CBOs that are applying. Um, as far as the priorities go, um, you know, I think one, uh, I, I'm supportive of the proposed priorities um, and certainly um, child care is a need that we hear of a lot. I think that is addressed in the thriving families core condition and making that a priority. Um, I'm also really supportive of number three, which is stable, affordable housing and shelter. And while yes, we do receive a significant amount of money to address homelessness, uh, it's through over 40 different grants and they're all restricted funding. And I've, the challenge I've consistently faced on this board is we know that there is a, a need, whether that's shelter or temporary housing or safe sleeping or safe parking, uh, but we just don't have the grant for it. And I really think that we need to prioritize some of this, some, our, 
some of our only discretionary funding in this county uh, for being able to address those high performing uh, and needed solutions to to homelessness, uh, to housing and shelter. Um, yeah, there's it's, it's just been a consistent consistent struggle. So I'm very supportive of allocating a uh, good portion of this funding. I mean, somewhere between one and two million um, to that core condition. Um, as far as other considerations, I agree generally with some of the comments that uh, Supervisor Cummings made, which is you know, ultimately with this funding, we're, we, yes, we want um, to encourage a, a variety of organizations uh, to apply, but ultimately our, our priority has to be the best results for the most people. Um, so you know, actually I remembered as far as the question of whether it should be a preference for state or, or federal funding, um, or, or being able to leverage state and federal funding. I kind of remember that being one of the notes coming out of the last process that we we did want to make sure that we had that information uh, and, you know, potentially prioritize uh, those programs that could leverage state and federal funding. Because at the end of the day, if it's a choice between one program where we're putting a dollar into the community and another where that dollar is matched by five dollars from the federal government, um, you know, the, the likelihood is that the six X impact is ultimately going to be the best thing for the community. I think we need that data at the very least. Um, I mean, I also think that we should at least uh, consider past performance. I mean, ultimately, this is the um, about results and evidence, and um, you know, we should have some accountability and uh, consider the results and the evidence that we're seeing when making uh, awards for the coming year. Um, and you know. Finally, I have, you know, I have to say, I, as Supervisor Cummings said, I don't know necessarily agree that small grants should be confined to small organizations. Large organizations can you know, be innovative too, and you know, see a need that they haven't been able to address before and use this opportunity to do so. Um, you know, of course, small organizations can be more nimble. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't be about one organization or another or prioritizing size one way or another. I think it's about prioritizing the best results for the community. So that's. Uh, I would like to see our consideration of the applications go. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. I have a couple of brief uh, comments on this before we open it up for the community. Um, first, there's an appreciation for the amount of work that has gone in. For, as uh, one of the two members on the board that have been through this, uh, that have seen both worlds and been through the process since uh, in the before times and the after times of the core process and in the iterations of core, um, it really has uh, significantly improved from the original vision to where it is now. And, and a lot of that is because of a, a real openness from you, the two of you in particular, but your team uh, to make these modifications as needed. I would like to just put a footnote in and a, a note of caution for our, our board that it, um, as we, it, it does feel though, just, just listening to this, that we're almost creating $8 million of process for $6 million of funding. And so I want to make sure that we, uh, don't get so slammed on wanting information and so slammed on on the amount of public outreach and so slammed on, on this that we actually forget that we actually need to, we're paying people to do things um, that are here for the safety net and every moment that they're doing this, they're not actually providing services and safety net. And I think at the end of the day, uh, we're, we're sometimes forgetting how much time with our additional direction we're tying up the team from doing the work that we actually all want them to do. And it just sounds like when I heard you describe what happened between our last vote and today, uh, that it was like three FTE equivalents worth of work that I would have rather have been delivering services to uh, the most needy in our community. And so I just want to caution us. So, I mean, at the end of the day, the data and all this information is useful, but if it's not going to really change our mind on anything, we should just um, trust the professionals to come back with professional recommendations. Um, two other points. One of them is uh, I recognize that there was no alignment on, uh, in essence, the set aside. I still think that that's a good idea because one takeaway I'm getting here is that we'll never create a perfect process. There's no such thing as a perfect process. There's five of us think that define it differently. The community defines it differently. CBOs define it differently. And so I feel as though we go through a defined process with what appears to be another uh, lot of check-ins between now and that that final day. And there will still be at the end of that process, um, those that feel that the process didn't deliver for them. 
And so as a result of that, I think it makes sense to have a percentage set aside for complete flexibility on things that either we couldn't have envisioned. And at that time in the last funding, there was actually world events that came out that were actually new needs kind of came up in that amount of time um, on programs that had historically been funded that weren't funded that maybe the board would have liked the flexibility. And even though technically we do have full flexibility on the funding, there's also an honoring of the process. Otherwise, what's the point of the process? So I'm still very supportive of having that uh, a percentage set aside for complete flexibility for these decisions. I actually think it would resolve a lot of what Supervisor Cummings is saying is that at the end of the day, if if we don't, if we understand the value, but maybe don't completely understand why something was prioritized over something, it allows at that last point to actually be able to fund that all the same. Uh, the second thing is that I understand that there was, um, I agree with both of my colleagues' comments on the leveraging component. I think that, um, I mean, there's a part of me that's debated whether we even should continue this at all. I mean, because of how much time and effort for this amount of investment, uh, 1%. And, but at the end of the day, if it can be leveraged, I think that there's a greater value there. And whether that's a, a, a priority versus whether it's just a percentage, I don't know. But I, I think that um, if a dollar can be turned into five or eight, Ultimately, I think that we can agree that there isn't enough money to fund all the worthy programs that are dealing with a safety net of issues that are exacerbated that are unique to this community due to cost of living and a million of other challenges that we have here. So it would behoove us to try and maximize that amount of money. And so I still believe uh, that we should do that as well. All right. Uh, we're going to open it. I'm sorry, please, Mr. I, Morris, I just want to make Director one Morris. comment about the set aside thinking that this is a reminder worthy of lifting up for public to respond to and then the board when you deliberate what to do. The lessons learned from two RFPs ago before I was here, CBOs were frustrated that staff recommended awards sometimes recommended they get funded at 50% of what they applied for. In response to that, and this is what I want to remind because it leads into an idea to consider. We had in the last RFP, which the board that was seated then approved, to give staff discretion up to 10% of what to do with the recommended awards to be able to make the math work. And we ended up using that 10% to deal with the pain point of a lot of the frustration. And so we'd reduced with board approval every grant by 10% and then repurposed that 10% to fund more. I only share that to say, if you don't give us additional direction today, we certainly can build into the RFP a concept like that, which is written so that the CBOs know they're going to get, if awarded something within the ballpark, whether they applied for, but potentially a certain percent, whether it be a staff follow-up to adjust or board discretion. I think there is some conceptual framework that worked last time that could be how to build into the next RFP. So I just wanted to remind that we already had that kind of set aside, not for, for, for all of us to, to play with accepting the recommended awards, but then making adjustments. So that already was built in the last RFP. We could figure out a way to build it in differently if we have different direction from you this time. I was envisioning it differently because um, the, re the reason for this review was because of a relatively universally held belief that it didn't function well. Um, I actually didn't share that belief. I felt it did function well. I think the fact that there was consternation and debate meant that the system was working because it wasn't the way it had always been historically. And that's, this is supposed, I mean, it's painful, right? But that's the point of, I mean, the one side, we can't say we want data and metrics and all this information on the other side, say, but nothing should change. It's like, what's, I mean, I don't understand the point of that. Those are divergent things. So I didn't, I didn't mind the challenge, but I'm saying at the, what I was just trying to solve, I was trying to land a plane that's going to be universal unless at that time there can be um, what is perceived of flexibility by board members, which I think is an underpinning component of this. Um, some define it as more data, more information, more transparency. That's great. But I think ultimately it's just people have a sense that their, their flexibility of decision-making is being taken away. And I'm trying to land that out as a 25% or whatever the number is to define that more clearly. All right. Um, I'd like to open it up for the community, for members of the community to address us on this item. Good afternoon. It's David Schwartz. Not quite afternoon yet. Um, candidate for tax seat when he leaves. Um, I'm not sure that this is the right place to mention this or not, but I, I would like to advocate for um, senior citizens. Uh, there's a great avalanche coming, and I know that we have programs for senior citizens, but I'm hearing that 
there's gaps. There's gaps in people that can't get to the doctor. There's people that can't get out of their house. There's people that can't find adequate food. There's people that can't afford housing at a level where oh, I don't think we're really looking at. You know, we like to think about the children. We think like think about the families. We like to think about, um, you know, the people that uh, we, we see every day, the, the, the uh, veterans that can't find a home. But I think we need to be prepared for this avalanche that's coming. And we need to start thinking about the needs of that group of people that maybe they don't have children, maybe they don't have a relatives, uh, maybe they live alone, um, maybe they don't have a phone even. Uh, so we, we need to go out there and look and see what we need to do to help people that can't help themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for waiting for this item. We do appreciate it. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I'm Corinne Jones. I'm the Director of Programs for Senior Network Services. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak just briefly. I want to encourage you um, to ensure that priorities are clear. Current and historically funded programs serving older adults need absolute consideration in core process. Um, the loss of funding for the Ombudsman Program, as an example, uh, has placed it in a bit of peril. Contrary to themes that I read in the um, community engagement process, there needs to be an alignment on how to prioritize uh, to make sure that the core funding be in alignment. And in, in terms of pri uh, the priority, the population of focus is very important. Older ad adults are separate and above and different than children. Someone once said, we do not want to see people become a hero of children while being a villain of older adults. We want heroes for everybody. And so uh, there are organizations that will give every dime they have to children or they will give it to conservative uh, con con uh, cons conservancy issues. That's what I'm trying to say. Just please keep in mind older adults. Um, they're in the twilight of their lives. Their dues have been paid, are, are surviving so many, many different things in this country has proven that. Keep them in mind. Please focus on them. Um, the elderly should be recognized because they are frail. They're older, and many of them have no other options other than the safety net programs that are provided. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Good morning. Welcome. Thank, welcome back. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. Thank you so much for the time and for all of your service. My name is Tracy Weiss. I'm the executive director with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey and currently serve as a commissioner on the Commission for Environment here at the county. Um, concern for the environment is at all time high. We know that a healthy, resilient environment is an important indicator and takes care of so many aspects of our community's health, well-being and livelihood. Recent reports from the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary regarding single-use plastics from the Resource Conservation District and the value that, that the natural world brings, along with the annual report that the Sea Odyssey puts out, demonstrates again and again that we know what we know intrinsically, that a healthy environment matters to our individual health, to our community vitality, and to economic prosperity. While I understand there is an incredible competition for a limited number of uh, resources, um, I am here to ask that we consider a fourth priority for next year, that the healthy environments be considered in this equation. At this time, healthy environments has not been mentioned as a priority, not only in our current grant cycle, but in for future funding. And I would really encourage us that we take a look at that. Um, as we invest in the natural world, we are investing in a climate resilient future, one that is equitable for all residents in our community. Um, I would ask that we put this as a consideration as we go forward. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you and thank you for your work. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, my name is Yadira Flores and I am a community mobilization leader with County Park Friends and also a park activity designer. And um, I also serve as a um, commissioner on the Latino Affairs Commission. And today I'm here to speak about uh, the core funding because in the most recent funding core cycles, zero percent of funds went to the condition called healthy environments. 
and this is a concern of mine because uh, this only highlights a fact of the that we know very well that only 4% of our budget overall goes to the healthy environments. 4% uh, of the conditions that I, I for fact know because I have worked in the community with the community presenting them with nature right there in their own community. And I have witnessed the beneficial effects the programs centered around community input have on mar marginalized communities. Mental health, as you hear here, uh, has been one of the most Im impact conditions positively with our nature. I would argue that we will need far less money for our health and wellness condition if all families have fair access to outdoor activities. I would like you to take uh, reference to the county park strategic plan based on, on input for over 1,000 residents in the previous six months. And in my opinion, mentioning this strategy will enhance the climate action strategy and provide more context for the funding suggestion. Hopefully you get that in consideration. Thank you. Thank you and thanks for your work. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, everyone. Mariah Roberts, um, Executive Director of County Park Friends. Thank you for your service, for all you do for our community. Um, <clears throat> so I applaud the intention of Human Services Department to invest in our community using a social determinants model called Core Investments. As a community, we've identified these eight core conditions needed for a thriving life. Um, however, as you've pointed out in your report, we have not always funded them equitably. Um, in the most recent cycle, zero funds went to the condition called healthy environments. Um, and so I bring your attention to the, the page 61 in the report. Um, again, we're applauding this uh, comprehensive assessment um, of the conditions, but, and again, it's showing that our, our funding is not balanced. Um, we're showing here that we have 4% of our total budget um, that's going to help the environment's core condition. And as my colleague said, you know, we'd posit that if all youth had equitable access to healthy environments through activities, et cetera, we would require much less uh, for potentially other conditions. Um, I want to highlight that most of us think of healthy environments as um, part of our identity and economy in this uh, community, but inequity is incredibly real. We have 2.7 acres per thousand people in Spahara Valley versus 27 park acres per thousand in North County. This needs to be addressed. Um, we understand that we might be able to apply under another condition. It's very disheartening, however, because we believe that healthy environments themselves have value. So just putting that forward, we would like to ask that you consider a fourth condition at least, um, and if you are able to act upon that, we would ask that um, in that second part of the report where you uh, look at different adopted plans to reference for your funding recommendations that you include the county parks strategic plan with its recently adopted um, uh, accepted five year uh, update 1500 community members gave input. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Welcome back. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Tony Nunez, Marketing and Communication Manager for uh, Community Bridges. And uh, before I start, I just want to say thank you to the Board of Supervisors and also the CAO's office. I also serve on the Board of Directors for the Pajar Valley Healthcare District, which oversees Watson Community Hospital. So just thank you for your continued support there. I wanted to speak today and share my uh, experience at the in-person uh, core input session in South County at the Watsonville Community uh, Room. Um, it was a really great conversation about what core currently is and what it could possibly be. And the last half hour of that session, um, when we were supposed to be going through uh, the survey questions and uh, giving our opinions on those, it uh, really evolved into a great conversation of nonprofit and human services providers, both big and small, medium uh, sized uh, service providers of uh, what the, the big concerns are for South County uh, service providers. And I just want to share both of them. Um, one is that 
there needs to be uh, uh, more of a, a focus on equity uh, with the idea that the biggest need with throughout the county is both in South County and the Live Oak area where those uh, two locations in the county are among the, uh, the quote unquote most unhealthiest places to live um, according to the Healthy Places Index um, uh, from the state of California. And then also that this process has not been focused on individuals, but it's been focused on equity for nonprofits. And I think that that's uh, the lens that we should be looking at this process is how do we keep equity um, at the center of this, but equity uh, not necessarily for nonprofit leaders, not necessarily for nonprofit providers, but for the people who uh, benefit from the services that the nonprofits provide. So thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Nunez. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Good afternoon, Clay Kemp, Seniors Council Area Agency on Aging, and I want to thank the board and staff for this thoughtful conversation and, of course, for the commitment to continuing to fund nonprofits and the recognition of how effective they are at helping our uh, community. A couple of points I need to make, some have already come up to, on today, but the report lists priorities of the Area Agency on Aging, and those actually aren't. That list of priorities did not come from us. That's why advisory council members haven't seen it. It's why our board hasn't seen those priorities. Uh, they came out of a meeting where various agencies serving older adults provided feedback. Even within that, there were some key components that are missing, so I want to share what those are. One is that we feel funding should be prioritized for life-sustaining programs. Somebody that provides food, shelter, protection from abuse, that needs to be elevated over a program that is showing at-risk populations something fun to do. Both are important, but we think there can be some prioritization there. Um, we also think mandated services need to be part of the priority. If something's required by law and it requires a local match, then that local match and that mandate, that mandate, be it federal, state, local, whatever, should take some precedence. And we also want to make sure that throughout the process that there's review of programs that are not funded as well as programs that are funded. And that's been a, a criticism of mine uh, since core version one happened, core version two, the same thing happened. If the board doesn't know the results of the funding process, it's hard to make good decisions. Um, we also would encourage revisiting CORE's intent to restate that it is about maintaining a local safety net because I think there's a lot of confusion about uh, what that should be. And then I just want to express our concerns over two things that have happened. Uh, first, first year of CORE, child care was cut by 150,000, senior programs cut by 100,000. Second year, senior programs were cut by 180,000, child care was eliminated. And I don't think that's the board's intent. We want to make sure the board does see the impact and the results of the process. Thank you, Mr. Kemp. Anybody else in chambers? Is there anybody online? Yes, sure. We have speakers online. Nora, your microphone's now available. Hi there, I'm Nora Caruso from the Santa Cruz Toddler Care Center co-director. I just want to start saying how heartening it is um, to feel heard. Um, at this time. Yeah, childcare was cut so significantly, had such a huge impact. And um, it feels good to know that that you saw that, that you noticed, and um, that you're paying attention. Thank you. Um, we specifically were cut 90% of our funding. We got the bridge funding for three months, um, and then we were we were completely dropped. So what that meant for us was that despite having 150 families on our waiting list and getting calls almost daily from mostly low-income families, I had to tell them, I'm sorry, we can no longer provide the sliding fee scale that we've provided for decades in this county, um, which is heartbreaking. You know, we do not want to be a center that provides childcare for the wealthy. Uh, we really want to provide care for a diverse population in our county. Um, we don't just provide childcare. We provide wraparound services such as home visits, parent support meetings, community events, healthy meals. Um, and the loss of this funding, you know, was, was incredibly impactful for, for our population. Um, the other thing I want to address is this idea of leveraging funds. As a small nonprofit, uh, we don't generally, we're not able generally to leverage federal and state funds from the county and the city, which means we really need your help with these funds. We're a small nonprofit. And finally, uh, thank you for including that quote in that first um, 
uh, slide that said, because of access to early care and education, I was able to keep my job in housing. This is the way in which you're leveraging funds. The ROI, the return on investment for childcare is $13 to every $1 spent. Please, thank you, consider childcare again. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, I see the priorities overall in this country going for munitions and warfare, billions to Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, etc., siphoning out funds from our county for needed services. We are in a corporate rule and dictatorship by these corporations. We need to address poverty, yes. We have poverty because of the structure of where the money's going and the very wealthy. You very disappointedly to me just prioritized your values when three of you voted to not have a ceasefire that would have temporarily at least stopped the obliteration of the civilians and thousands of people in Palestine and stopped the money flow for these weapons. The money you do have, you asked about our priorities as citizens living here. I'd like to see a rule of first do no harm, prove policies are safe, and you have radiated the environment with all the broadband cell towers, cell antennas, radar signs. This creates an unhealthy environment and assault on our health, and you have been provided with data on those facts over the years, including you, from Barry Trower. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Are there any additional speakers online? Yes, Chair. Just as a reminder, this is a core, the comment should be associated with the item. Core funding, please. Heather, your microphone's now available. Hi, I'm Heather Burkez, and I'm one of the co-executive directors at the Santa Cruz Toddler Care Center. I second everything that Nora Caruso said. I am here to urge this committee to prioritize the categories lifelong learning and education and thriving families in the upcoming core RFP. To address one of the current needs in our county and the Santa Cruz Childhood Advisory Council's 2023 strategic plan, they noted that Santa Cruz County has a shortage of about 15,000 childcare spaces and that there are 12,700 children who would be eligible to receive subsidized childcare but are unserved. More specifically, only 20%, six, sorry, 26% of the demand for infant toddler care is being met. That means our county is not meeting the childcare need of 74% of families with children two years and younger. In a United Way study, they have noted that after housing, child care is the second biggest expense families face. The lack of child care deeply impacts the financial stability of young families because without child care, parents are unable to return to the work force. This places families in a struggle to survive and in a place to seek other county health services, like for housing and food insecurity, that they might not need if they were able to join the workforce. This lack of funding negatively impacts the programs that are able to serve these communities and is turning quality childcare programs into places that serve the affluent and are taking away equity in our community. It is time for our county to start putting young families and one of our most vulnerable populations at the forefront. I strongly urge you to prioritize these two categories in the upcoming core RFP. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Uh, this is Lynn McKibben. I live in Boulder Creek and I'm a senior citizen and I've just come to 
make a few comments about seniors in our county. Our senior center in San Lorenzo Valley was one of the competitors for the last round of grants. And of course, we didn't score quite well. So we lost our county grant. Um, and we were really in, in danger of closing as other senior centers in the county have in the past. Um, however, our board stepped up and, and has been running this, this senior center for two years now, three years now, and doing a marvelous job, but um, we are looking for other funding um, for, for staff. So I, I, I just really feel that there's not enough understanding or recognition of the enormous positive contribution that senior centers make to the equitable health and well-being of seniors in Santa Cruz County. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board for a motion. Is there a motion? Supervisor Cummings? Yes, uh, I'll make the move. Yes, I'll make the motion. I'm just going to bring it up real quick. Um, so just want to thank everyone again for weighing in on this. I think we've got a lot of great information about what the community wants to see as priorities, and hopefully we can incorporate that into this process. And so, um, the recommended actions consider presentation on the core and report for fiscal year 2022-23 and report back on community engagement. Provide direction on the staff recommendation for prioritization for the next core RP funding cycle. And what I'd like to add to that is the, in addition to the staff recommended categories, um, add environment, health, healthy environments and stable, affordable housing and shelter. And that was something that Supervisor Koenig brought up as something he thought would be important to include in this process. And hearing from the community, there's a lot of, um, you know, if we don't have healthy environments, we don't, we're not able to exist. And so I think that allowing for people, um, a lot of organizations working in the environmental sector to apply is really important. And so um, adding those two, sorry for the comments in the middle of the motion, and um, and then direct the Human Services Department to return on or before April 30th, 2024, with the recommendations for the draft of the next cycle of the Corn Investments RFP. I, if I got a nod, it's appropriate. I just want to clarify, as you consider additional direction, the current direct the current recommendation from staff does include to prioritize stable affordable housing and shelter so that's already included in the staff recommendation what's not is the one you added so just the technical issue in terms of if you get a vote of adding a fourth i would just say as staff you asked us to come back and narrow it's completely your choice but we're trying to narrow based on the data we shared with you well then i'd, I'd like to add healthy environments based on the feedback we had today is there a second? Second. Is there additional discussion? Um, do you need it as additional direction? Some of the comments that were made in regards to um, either set asides or the leveraging? If agreeable to the board, short answer, no. We tracked closely. We'll rewatch this and we'll do everything we can to incorporate all the comments you made as our elected officials and build it in and affirmatively point out how we incorporated those into the RP, including if for some reason as staff, we didn't see a way to include it. Like we have to consult with GSD on the county's public procurement process and we can release RFPs. There's things we'll work on. We will name what we've incorporated and we'll name if we haven't, why not? And then you can then deliberate and accept or redirect. That's part of the, so I think we're fine and we will try to incorporate all we can into the RFP. Okay. I'm fine then. Um, we have a motion for the recommended actions with an additional direction. Should we do a roll call? We'll do in a second from Supervisor Hernandez. We got a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And I'm going to uh, request that we actually break into closed session now for about 30 minutes. Uh, we can return at 1245. Is there anything that we anticipate to be uh, reportable out of closed session? No. All right, so the board will be in closed session until about 1245. We'll be back here. Sure. And then we're going to move on to... Recording uh, in progress. Sorry. We're going to move on to item nine. It's a 
public hearing to consider a report on the 2024 growth goal, adopt a resolution establishing a growth rate of 0.5% for year 2024 in the unincorporated area, uh, excuse me, the unincorporated portion of the county and authorize the planning staff to file CEQA notice of exemption as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO Director of County Community Development and Infrastructure. With the agenda board memo item, the resolution establishing the growth goal, the CEQA notice of exemption, growth goal report, the planning commission res resolution staff report and the growth report cover letter. Uh, good afternoon, I apologize for that. I appreciate both of you waiting, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Friend, and good afternoon, Board of Supervisors, Mark Connolly, Principal Planner in Policy for CDI. With me this afternoon is, to my right, is Natisha Williams, Senior Planner in Policy for CDI. And what we have for you today is the 2024 aforementioned growth goal. And what this does is really sets forth a target for the unincorporated area for market rate growth. The process annually is uh, twofold. One is it needs to go to the Planning Commission for recommendation to the board. First of all, so that happened on October 25th, 2023, where the Planning Commission uh, heard the item and recommended unanimously that the board adopt the 2024 growth goal. They did have a few small comments that are addressed in your staff report before you today. Uh, so with that, I'll ask the clerk to uh, bring up the presentation and Atisha Williams will provide a brief presentation for you. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon. You can start the presentation. Um, so today uh, we're here to discuss the 2024 growth goal. The county's growth management system was institute, instituted in 1979 following adoption of Measure J to address the resource and public services impacts of population growth in Santa Cruz County. As part of the growth management system, each year the county is required to set an annual growth goal for the upcoming year that represents a fair share of the state's growth. And the 2024 growth goal report is before you today for consideration. So um, this report examines various factors. Oh, actually one back. It's used in establishing the year 2024 growth goal for the unincorporated area, including analysis of population growth trends, resource constraints, the status of this year's market rate residential building permit allocations, the county's housing needs, including progress towards meeting the county's required um, regional housing needs allocation or RENA, a review of de demolition permits and density bonus projects approved in the past year, as well as the ADU annual report. This year's report also includes a discussion of the current pipeline of subsidized affordable housing projects and the continued impacts of recent state law on the county's growth management system. In response to the comments from um, the Planning Commission, additional language is also provided in the report um, on the current Highway 1 expansion and its progress um, that's added to the Urban Services section on page 19. So population growth rates. In recent years, the county's population has been um, fairly stagnant and even negative based on the Department of Finance estimates. Population growth for the county overall in 2022 experienced a negative growth rate of negative 1.1%, um, and that's one point, negative 1 1.3% in the unincorporated area. The state of California contracted at a rate of negative 0.4% in 2022, which is actually up from the previous year's zero, negative 0.5%. And it's important to note when you're looking at these numbers that Housing unit construction plays a really big part in how the DOF population estimates are created. So the DOF also reported that recent unprecedented decline in um, the population of California slowed last year due to three main factors, stable births, fewer deaths, and a rebound in foreign immigration that um, nearly returned to pre-pandemic levels. But overall population growth is still negative due to the decline of net domestic migration, which they, um, they say is likely the result of work from home changes. Since the mid 20th century, population has steadily grown in the state of California and in the county as a whole, while population in the unincorporated area has had a slightly different trajectory. The unincorporated area's population grew rapidly in the 1960s and 70s, surpassing growth rates in the state and county as a whole. Um, but growth rates started to decline in the following dec decades, and population actually decreased in our area between 2000 and the 2010 census years. Um, despite recent declines in the year-to-year -year population estimates reported by the DOF, 
Uh, the 2020 census data actually showed that overall the county's population in the unincorporated area is actually on the rise with an average 0.2% uh, growth over the last decade, a total increase of about 2,400 people since 2010. Um, the, measure, uh, the growth goal report also summarizes the current status of the 2024 residential building permit allocations. This year, 24 allocations have been granted as July 1st. And if that uh, demand trajectory continues, 48 allocations will be granted by the end of the year. This is slightly lower than last year when 26 building permit allocations had been granted by July 1st. Um, but demand for allocations remains low compared to previous decades and staff anticipates there will be more than enough permits available for the remainder of this year, which is nearly an end. Um, although allocations remain low this year, uh, a number of major residential projects are currently in construction. And um, projects currently in development are reflected in Table 10 of the report, which shows that 108 housing units were issued building permits as of July 1st. That includes 38 affordable units and 51 accessory dwelling units. And these, um, just wanted to note that these types of units, affordable and accessory dwelling units, are not subject to the growth management system. In order to support uh, the county's affordable housing goals, the county continues to exempt affordable housing units and ADUs from the need to obtain permit allocations. Um, and in accordance with the Housing Crisis Act of 2019, the county will continue to not enforce the Measure J growth goal limit on residential allocations within affected county areas while the statute is in place, which was extended to 2030 with the passage of SB 8. So in Santa Cruz County, the affected areas include the following census designated places shown in blue on this map. That's Live Oak, Pasta Tiempo, Paradise Park, and Amesti. But I do want to note that all other aspects of Measure J related to limiting building permits and the population, um, including the county's affordable housing requirements, are not at all impacted by this bill. So staff will continue to track the Measure J allocations and subsequent building permit issuance in the affected areas solely for the purposes of reporting and um, continuing reporting this, this type of data in this report. So let's see, in addition, all residential units impacted by the CZU August Lightning Complex will continue to be exempt um, so that the Measure J allocation system is not a burden to those, to those um, residents. Based on analysis detailed uh, in the report before you today, staff recommends that the growth goal be set at 0.5% for calendar year 2024. In past years, the county's growth goal has generally been consistent with the state of California's growth rate. However, um, for many of those years, actual development fell well below the established growth goal. And with many um, housing initiatives, as well as the um, state housing initiatives, as well as the regional housing needs allocation, which is three and a half times larger than the old one, um, and code improvements that are coming our way with the sustainability update that will soon be implemented. Um, there's a greater potential for housing development in the county in the coming year. Um, and moreover, census data indicates that the population's county um, is actually on the rise, and AMBAG, AMBAG projections show that this um, slight increase will probably continue. So. There's also, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a number of housing projects currently in the permitting pipeline, and we've seen slight elevation in permit activity in recent years. So it all points to a potential increased demand for market rate permits that may continue through next year and beyond. Um, it's also important to note, oh, I did already note that there's a lot of state housing and ADU laws that are aimed at streamlining, how, uh, streamlining housing permits and increasing infill development, such as SB9. Um, and in light of all of this, we're recommending the 0.5% growth rate. We feel it's inappropriate um, to set it at that rate for 2024. Um, and I did want to mention also um, that there was a comment or a concern from the uh, Planning Commission regarding the RENA. And I wanted to note that um, the regional housing allocation only, um, this it applies to both market rate and affordable units, while the growth goal is strictly um, only limits the development of market rate units. And if we looked at just this year alone, the allocation is 465 units, which is about 30% of the total um, number of units above mod units required in the, the RENA or over, over the eight year span of the, the next RENA cycle. So um, we think that this, this is a realistic target. Um, 
would see. So this growth rate, growth rate would result in an allocation of 257 market res residential permits available for 2024. Allocations will be distributed in between the urban and rural areas between at 75 and 25 percent to recognize greater potential for infill development in urban areas. And um, the growth goal also recommends carrying over um, unused market rate allocations from 2023 to 2024. So this results in that 465 market rate residential building permit allocations for 2024. And staff has found that establishment of the growth goal is exempt under CEQA. And a notice of exemption has been prepared and included in your packet. As Mark mentioned, this was reviewed by the Planning Commission at a public hearing on October 25th and recommended for approval. Staff therefore recommends that the Board of Supervisors conduct a public hearing to consider the report on the year 2024 growth goal, adopt the attached resolution establishing a year 2024 growth goal of 0.5% for the unincorporated portion of the county, and authorize the filing of the secret notice of exemption with the clerk of the board. So that con concludes the presentation and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions from Supervisors? Uh, Supervisor Koenig? Thank you, Chair. Well, I, you addressed my question, which is how do we square the, the growth goal with the arena numbers? Um, and as you pointed out, the majority of our arena numbers are for are actually affordable units. Um, so if I, I think I caught your, your math there, which is you said that the 465 units is actually 36%, 30%. Um, okay, but so we need, well, it, <laughs> Six to four sixty five is it's about double if you average right. it over the eight years. So we need a, we we have about fifteen hundred and fifty units over the eight years that we should build. So that's only one hundred ninety three, one hundred ninety four units. So the growth goal effectively will not limit our ability to meet our goals. Over the eight years, correct? Okay, great. Thanks, Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, thanks for that presentation. Two questions. Um, you know, it seems like this just focuses on market rate. Is there any kind of provision that the county has that also sets similar goals for affordable housing growth, knowing that's the, you know, the housing that we need for our workers and our community members? So Measure J included our inclusionary housing policy, which sets that 15% um, requirement that you're aware of. But um, the growth goal used to apply to affordable units, but they found that I think back in 2009, the mid 2000s, they decided to limit it just to market rate and they removed ADUs and they removed um, affordable housing because they didn't want this to be an impediment to developing those types of units. So, so currently, no, those are not part of that. That is the growth goal. So it sounds like though there, there may be an opportunity if we wanted to explore implementing growth goals for affordable housing, that that's something the board could consider. Potentially, yeah. And it, it was done in the past in previous years. Okay. Um, that's really helpful to know. And then I guess in terms, this is a capacity issue because I know earlier this year we had a, a lot of folks coming in about, you know, planning and needing permits and having trouble getting permits. And so I'm just wondering how, um, you know, the ability to permit aligns with these growth goals. Like, do we have the capacity to keep up with the permits that are coming in in order to meet these goals so that we're not falling behind? I'm just given a lot of, you know, the public feedback that we've heard about people's challenges with getting building permits. Are you talking about like ensuring that that the growth goal is not a burden on people developing and processing their building permits or? I guess it's it's really, it's, you know, wanting to better understand like if we have a number that's set for like, okay, these are the number of units we want to build. Is that the capacity within the county to kind of meet um, the, you know, to be able to meet those goals? Right. Yeah. So part of, um, part of what the growth uh, management system establishes is, um, not only like setting this maximum, but also developing policies um, that can encourage us to reach the growth goal as well. And that's definitely within the purview of, of, of the board. Um, and uh, we can, you know, come back with proposals if the board so directs. But um, currently, if I could, if I could chime in just a, just a tiny bit to Supervisor Cummins' uh, question, I think you're talking about even our staffing levels to manage the permits coming through the front door to meet the growth goal and to meet the arena goal and all the goals that we've established, I would say it'll continue to be a struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at our numbers today, uh, like our permit reviews are overdue, we're in the mid 60% range of overdue. And so it is a struggle. Uh, we've been trying to balance with um, keeping positions filled. You know, we have a fair amount of turnover from retirements and difficulty recruiting new staff. 
And so we were trying to balance um, an aggressive recruitment strategy and an aggressive third party use for plan check services and a balance between those two. Uh, we do have a goal this year well, for the next two years, an objective that the board have adopted to get down to, I think is 25% overdue, which is probably accurate because some applications are gonna be overdue because of the quality control they have. Uh, we're not at that goal yet. We're striving for it, but I think it's gonna be a struggle. So you, you point out something really important and uh, I would say it will be difficult but we're gonna keep working at it. Great, well, thanks for that. And whatever we can do to, to help support you all in your efforts to you know, staff up. I mean, I think that we all wanna you know, try to make us as, as efficient as possible. So thank you. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Chair Kona? Kona? Yeah, I have one, one more question that occurred to me. You know, um, so the, re the reading number is kind of funny, right? Because while it only requires us to do a certain number of market rate units, the fact of the matter is that the affordable units either have to be subsidized or we need to build roughly five times as much market rate housing in order to build one affordable unit so that the market rate housing can subsidize it. So actually, come to think of it, this growth goal could very much come into conflict with our ability to build the affordable units required for us under the arena number. I mean, and at that point, I mean, let's say a project is proposed that has where we're starting to would put us over the cap of the growth goal but would add a certain, whatever, 50 affordable units, therefore you know, contributing towards the rate of number that we need and are still short, could we come into conflict with state law at that point and have to approve the project despite the fact that it would put us over the growth goal? Well, um, there's, we can always come back to the board if we see that we're meeting that that growth goal that's set. We can always come back and because we'll, you know, especially if it's an affordable housing project, we'll definitely be aware of it coming through the pipeline before it gets to the building permit stage. Um, so we can always come, return to the board and request that we increase that growth goal to set it to an appropriate. If something unprecedented comes, if there's a, a large number of projects that come forward mm -hmm. that would set uh, that would that the growth goal might limit or prevent some sort of project from being issued a permit. Okay. I mean, it's, um, you in order to build 3,000 affordable units at a 15% inclusionary rate, that's actually like 20,000 market rate units, right? It's, um, I mean, part of the reason why the arena numbers are very much um, aspirational. But thank you. Although I, I will just um, point out that a lot of our affordable units are 100% projects, just like. Um, the uh, new Capitola project, Capitola Avenue project, is 100 percent, 57 percent, you know, 100 percent, and that actually we're seeing a lot of affordable, 100 uh, percent affordable that are subsidized by tax credits and other federal and state programs, be built because, uh, frankly, the market rate projects are having trouble now throughout the county, other than City of Santa Cruz penciling. I've talked to people who own property in Watsonville, just for example, they can't make pro they have projects entitled and they cannot build them because they're just not penciling out market rate. But yet there's affordable projects. There's three affordable right now being built in one small 100%. Right, and, that, and that's great as long as the project-based vouchers keep flowing, but they could run out. Yeah, I, I too was concerned about the growth goal compared to arena numbers. And I'm just, just generally concerned that, uh, you know, what formula is used, uh, if it's going to enhance the ability of the state to come in and tell us what we have to do, really is an overhanging cloud, I think, in all of this. And uh, a big concern of mine, but you won't have to worry about that for after one more year. <laughs> Quitter. Um, I would now like to open up uh, the public hearing. This is a public hearing. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us in chambers during this public hearing? Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? I see no speakers, Chair. Okay, we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Koenig, I'll move the recommended actions. A second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig, a second from Supervisor Cummings. We got a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Fred? Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you both for your work and for their presentation. We'll move on to item 10, which is to consider a status report on the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA public assistance for the county's disaster response and recovery. Direct staff to return R number four, February 13th, 2024, with debt financing options for unreimbursed and unfunded disaster recovery efforts and take voted actions outlined in the memo of the CAO. And I believe we have a presentation from the CAO, Mr. Palacios. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair Friend, members of the board, Carlos Palacios, County Administrative Officer. Uh, more than three decades ago, I started my career in local government. And I remember uh, at that time hearing about what we used to call global warming uh, for the first time. And um, we weren't sure what it really meant and what the impacts it would have. And um, I do remember then um, in 2006, Al Gore came out with his documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, which really spelled out at that time, 2006, two decades ago, um, the cause of global climate change and what many of the impacts uh, were going to be uh, on the world we live in. Um, well, we are seeing the impacts of climate change uh, in Santa Cruz County, not only in the frequency and severity of storm and fire events that we are facing, uh, but also on the impact on the county budget. Santa Cruz County is particularly vulnerable among counties in our state, largely because of our geographic setting. Um, large portions of our county are in the mountain areas or on the coastal zone. That leads us to a, um, an environment that's particularly vulnerable to the climate change we are seeing. In addition, the county, as we have told you before, has historically been underfunded mainly due to the way property taxes are distributed in the state of California uh, beginning in 1978 after Proposition 13. Because of all these factors, the county budget is now under great stress uh, due to the repeated um, severe federal disaster events that we have been faced with. Uh, we have been faced with seven federally declared disasters in the last six years, which is we're used to it now, but it's shocking when you think about it to have seven federally declared disaster events in the last six years in our county alone. Uh, the biggest issue for us is the way that FEMA is structured and how they reimburse us uh, for these events. Um, it is taking on average three to five to six years to get reimbursed. Their model is broken because they're being faced nationwide with the, so many uh, different events. And because of the slow uh, the pace at which we are being reimbursed, uh, we are facing a very severe budget problem that is mainly due to cash flow. Um, the good news is that we will be reimbursed. The problem is, is that we are spending money at such a pace that we are putting pressure on our cash flow and our ability to respond to these emergencies. So um, we are going to be, as you will see in this presentation, be forced to issue debt um, to finance our cash flow until we're able to get reimbursed by FEMA. So that is what uh, I am here to talk to you about. And um, as you can see, we're going to review some of the, the disasters that the nation and our state is being faced with, talk about the financial situation of the storm response we've had, and then what we are going to do in the long, near and long term to, to respond to this. Uh, since in 2023, there were 25 uh, federally declared disasters. And again, this is where uh, we've become a numb to this, but it's shocking when you think about it. Uh, there we are, uh, California flooding in January through March. That was our 2023 flooding. Uh, but you'll also see the the uh, Maui uh, fires that had took place this year, which again is unprecedented. And then all the other um, severe um, weather events uh, from storm damages to hurricanes that have come across the country. And this is part of the story is that FEMA is under a tremendous pressure um, both from a staffing point of view and from a financial point of view. They're being faced with all of these disasters. This is just 2023, mind you. Just one year, 25 federally declared disasters that they are having to respond to from a staffing perspective and then try and reimburse local governments um, in a system that really was built on a disaster happening to a local community once every decade, not seven in six years. And so that's really the fundamental change that, that we need to have happen at the federal level. This is another uh, chart that shows you the frequency of 
the disasters that our nation has been facing. Uh, you can see there um, were anywhere an average of, let's say, six events, federal disasters, all through the 80s, even up to the early 2000s. Uh, you can see 2000, 1992, which is when I first heard about global climate change. There was like six or so, and then you'd see 2006 when Al Gore was talking about it. There was like seven or eight. And then you can see in the last decade, really, from 2014, 15, we've just had I mean, more and more federally disasters declared up to um, last year, which we have 25. Uh, compare that to 1980, where we had three federal disasters declared. And you can see that most of them are in storm events and in uh, wildfire events. This is in the state of California, the number of disasters we are being faced since 1980. And you can see that uh, we had as few as one going into the 80s. Um, and um, and then now you can see in the last decade, we've had multiple uh, multiple events. And again, mainly storm disasters and fire disasters, which is what we have been faced with as a county. Uh, so in Santa Cruz County, we have had seven uh, federally declared that disasters in the last six years. Uh, 2017, there were three federal disasters. Uh, 2020, the Lightning Complex Fire, which was the most severe fire event we've had in our history. 2023 was another very severe winter storm, two, dis two disasters. And then, of course, we had that um, the COVID-19 thrown in there as well, uh, which was also uh, very difficult on all county governments because we were the first responders on the ground uh, as county governments. And again, I wanted to mention that uh, we as a county are um, in some ways uh, the canary in the coal mine because we are so vulnerable to given our geographic setting. So this is just a few pictures. You know this, but I think, you know, the public and knows this as well. This is just uh, 2017. There were three federal disasters. This is just examples of what happens to our roads as they are faced with this um, amount of, of water in such a short time period. Um, you can see the 237 damaged sites in 2017, and you can just see them all over the county. Um, 2017, we've had 120 um, projects completed, um, but you can see that there's still sites that we haven't even got gotten to yet in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point, I'll also point out that I'm very proud of the response of our Public Works Department um, and the other departments that have been involved in these responses, because it's truly amazing the work that we have done. We have done really, really, really good work in responding. But you can see that this, this sheer scale is becoming overwhelming to us as county staff. And of course, 2019, we had um, the pandemic uh, when you know we had to really uh, mobilize our whole county government uh, to deal with that. 2020, uh, the lightning complex fire, the most severe fire in county history. And then 2023, which was another very severe winter storm event. And you can see the um, events that most impacted us as you see the red lines coming in there to the central coast. You see there's a December 31st, a January 5th, and then of course the March 10th, March 10th being when the Powder River flooded. All three of those events were at, we had many more atmospheric rivers, but all of those caused severe flooding. You can see in this map that we had uh, more than 200% of our annual uh, rainfall that year. And again, 2023 was in some ways without precedent, but it happened in 2017 as well. 215 uh, project sites, damage sites, again, all over the county, particularly our uh, coastal areas and our mountain communities have been affected. The scope, again, we've, we've become numb to this, but it's truly shocking the number of the damage that was done to our county doing these during the 2017, 2023, 20, and 2020 fires. This is the projects that have been completed, um, eight, roughly 86 projects. And again, 
very proud of our public works department and all the crews that have done an engineering staff that have done tremendous work trying to respond on to this. And another thing to keep in mind is that not only, of course, OR3 has been very involved in this as well. Uh, planning staff has been very well involved in it. We are um, not having to do this in a vacuum. We have our normal work we're doing, right? So this is on top of all the normal work that staff are being asked to do. They're asked to be responded to all this. So here's the, the financial data. And then the data is, um, again, very large numbers. You can see the 2017 storms, COVID-19, 2020 wildfire, 2023 um, storms as well. Um, $250 million approximately that we uh, are eligible for claims, uh, either um, FEMA or federal highways. And by the way, that's not the total cost. We actually spent much more than $250 million on these disasters. These are just the costs that are eligible uh, for federal um, state reimbursement. And then you can still see that we have $159 million outstanding. Um, and that number is putting a lot of pressure on the county budget and is really pushing our county to its limit on the cash flow that we are able to continue to maintain to respond to these emergencies. We're really at our limit about our ability to continue to float these responses awaiting uh, reimbursement from the federal agencies. You can still see that we have $20 million from 2017 that is still not being reimbursed. Six years ago, we're still waiting. Uh, $48 million, almost $49 million from um, 2020 when the COVID uh, three years ago. And then of course we still have 2020, 15 million, and then we have the new disaster. So that's that's really the issue that's before us as a county is that we're having to really um, reorder our total budget priorities. And we're gonna have to um, issue debt uh, to maintain our ability to keep, um, to, to basically fund this cash flow awaiting the response from FEMA and other federal agencies to get reimbursed. This is an example of the cost of the storms versus our uh, general fund taxes. General fund taxes are the amount of money that's more discretionary in the county, although it's all committed to very, very important things. And you can see that the storms responses um, in 2020, um, 21 and 2023 are getting to the point where they're almost equal to our title or entire uh, general taxes that we're getting in. So in other words, we're spending on these responses, almost the entire amount of taxes, general fund taxes we're getting in. And again, the good news is we're going to get reimbursed and that's really good news, but the problem is the timing. And so um, what we need um, from you is a few things. Uh, one is that we're going to be coming back uh, to you to ask uh, for you to authorize us to issue debt, to f to basically keep our cash flow in a healthy position so that we can await getting these uh, reimbursements. Um, second, I'm gonna ask that we impose on Chair Friend if possible. Um, we've already imposed upon him quite a bit to help us with this. <laughs> and um, he's built a number of relationships with uh, FEMA uh, nationally, with NACO nationally, uh, in helping us to get this fundamental changes that are needed at the federal level, because this is really the federal government and local governments are being faced with circumstances which we have not faced be from before. This is unprecedented, the amount of money we're having to spend on the disaster responses. And FEMA is not ready for it. So Chair Friend has been um, building relationships and has uh, facilitated meetings in Washington and uh, locally with FEMA. And I'd ask that if you're amenable to it, that you continue to help us since you have built those relationships as we have to continue to work with the federal agencies and with our elected representatives to bring about getting reimbursed on these costs. And then ultimately, this is going to affect all local governments that we need fundamental change in the way that the FEMA's organized. They just have to be um, much quicker in reimbursing or they have to be able to front money up, up front. You can imagine um, Lahaina right now facing a billion dollars. I mean, that little county government, city county government, they, they can't do that. 
and we're to the point where we can't do that. And other counties in, in uh, California are being faced by the same thing. So that's what our request is from you today. And we um, will return to you, we hope, in early February with a plan uh, on the debt issuance. It's going to be very complicated because some of this debt is going to have to come back within a year because some of the we're getting reimbursed, you know, anywhere from one year to six, seven years, right? So it's going to have to be different time periods um, as well. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. Are there questions from board members? Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, it just a terrible circumstance um, and the uncertainty of it all, too. Uh, thank you for that comprehensive report. And um, this is the biggest challenges we faced, uh, financial challenges, since I've been on the board for the last 11 years. And uh, I, as you have mentioned, I've been... We, our public works department can't be, it can't be stressed. And then our health and human services too with COVID and all, just to how much extra effort and committed effort that they have put in over the years. It's really to be, uh, really be appreciated. And we really need the support of state and federal agencies. And uh, we understand that situation, as you pointed out on your national map, these disasters are going on everywhere. We just had with that tornado in Tennessee, there's, there's another one on the list. Um, it just keeps on going, but um, we can't afford to absorb those costs that we're getting here um, or borrow in a way that could affect our credit rating. We, we, um, we'll consent to continue um, conversations uh, with federal uh, and state agencies to see the best that we can do. Uh, realize that they're, they're stressed as well. Uh, it's, um, and it's really a, uh, very concerning too, whether we just have read about the recent state budget crisis that they're about ready to face too. So it's uh, it's not made easier in any any way. And I think that uh, we do have a reserve, but we do have to say, we've got to be, have that ready to go to, for the immediate needs too, when we, the next disaster hit. And I don't mean to be negative on that, but uh, it's, we're just lucky we didn't get the uh, last Oregon, Washington storm that we had. So uh, thank you for this oversight. Uh, very depressing in some respects, but realistic. And so we have to do the best we can. And I think our county staff has done that. So thank you. Supervisor Cummings. I just want to thank um, Tia Palacios for bringing this to, not only to our attention, but to the attention of our community so they can really understand how we've been getting impacted by the storms and the disasters that we've faced over the past few years. Um, it's, it's just crazy to think that when I uh, started it, um, studying biology back in 2001, everybody was saying in 20 years, if we don't do something about this, here's what's going to happen. And now it's actually happening. And so I think it's really important that we're following the science and listening to it because um, everything's playing out as was predicted. Um, I um, and, and I agree that, you know, I don't think FEMA was ever set up to um, help address the magnitude and frequency of disasters that we're seeing at this point in time. And so really being able to figure out how we can get the federal government to seriously take the fact that we need to change the system so that we're able to actually continue to operate as local government. Because otherwise, I mean, if we get hit with another bout of, of disasters this winter, it's going to be really unclear how we're going to be able to continue to move forward. So I um, appreciate the um, request for the to go out and bond, and I hope we can continue to educate the community on why this is necessary. And then I would just um, ask for one change to the language, which would be to direct the supervisor friend to work with the staff, because since we're going to have a change in the chair next year, likely, I um, just want to make sure that he can continue to work in that role as he works with staff. I'll oppose the language change. Um, supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you to our CAO and, and staff for this sobering report. And we've really, especially DPW, has done everything possible to keep our roads passable um, and just completed an incredible number of projects in this past year. But uh, what we're seeing is that without changes uh, at the state and federal level, particularly federal and the way FEMA is funded, it's just not sustainable. Um, I just had a couple of questions. I mean, I, the, the map you showed of the 25 uh, federally declared disasters across the country is, um, you know, an important context. Do we know what the total number of claims is across all those disasters and then how much FEMA is actually being funded per year? I'm just, you know, what is the shortfall there in terms of how much FEMA is being funded? And then is there a, an average wait time right now? Um, six years? 
10 years but that uh, before folks are, or communities are seeing reimbursement for these disasters. I don't have, um, I don't know if STAP has a, a day read if, if you have a national figure um, in terms of total. I know that the 25 federal disasters are over a billion each, but let me see if you have it. Um, so we, we're we working closely with FEMA to, to get to the, the heart of your question. I think they're recognizing both post-COVID that they need to hire more people so that they can process claims quicker. So we know that that's coming on the COVID lens. And then we're working very closely with our state and, and federal partners to try and move our stuff through more quickly as well. But from a national standpoint, I don't have those statistics unless Marcus does. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't have that data nationally about the FEMA's funding status and where they're at or not. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, what I can speak to is our claims experience. Um, you know, Mr. Palacio has put up the slide and you can see over the last seven years, we've had various experiences with FEMA over seven disasters and the staff are great. It's the process that's holding it back. And in those seven disasters in seven years, um, we've seen about 35, 20 to 35 percent reimbursement on our COVID or CZU claims, and those are you know, getting close to four years old. Um, we've had better success with the 2017. Some of that is our funded through a different federal program, and that's largely the success of so FEMA. I think we're, we should expect five, seven, maybe nine years, if, unless we keep up our advocacy efforts, and that's been instrumental. Um, the last uh, 12 plus months, we've seen a lot more activity than we saw previously. So and unfortunately goes, goes to that. We've got to find the time and space and, and, and keep advocating for, our, for ourselves. Right. And, and to that point, the memo suggested there's some hope we could be reimbursed for at least a larger portion of uh, the COVID expenses soon. Um, you know, what's, what's the grounds for that? Are we seeing other communities getting those reimbursements? We've just gotten some positive positive uh, feedback from FEMA. We're spending three hours with them um, Monday, 9 a.m. on December 18th. Uh, so they've they've committed largely in, in thanks to uh, Chair Friends advocacy and, and our federal representatives. They've, FEMA staff are coming here with Cal OES staff and we're prioritizing our COVID claims. We've got about 50 million, 48 million in change. They're still outstanding, they're just stuck. And so our, our, our efforts and our aim for that three plus hours is to get through every one of those claims I identify the ones that are no-brainers we should move forward. We have high confidence that a lot of them are ready to go. So we budgeted 14.4 million that we received this year. We're at 200,000. So we have a long ways to go to get to that 14 million mark, but we certainly aim to get higher than that. So I was able to get some data from, from Jason Hoppin. Um, so uh, kind of orders of magnitude, the annual appropriations for FEMA is in the order of magnitude of 10, 10 to 20 billion a year. Over the last number of years, we've seen 50, 60, 70 billion dollars worth of damages nationwide. So that's where we get, you know, each year the continuing funding resolutions have to make up and fix that. But FEMA is systemically underfunded at their at their annual allocation level, and then they have to pivot and adjust. Got it. Well, thank you for that data, and uh, thank you for the continued advocacy with FEMA, including your meeting next week. Mm -hmm. I think that really underlines the other point that was made, uh, which is this: not only is it an incredible strain on our cash flow, it's an incredible strain on counted time to address these disasters, not only while they're happening, but uh, in the follow-up to try to get reimbursement. Thank you. You know, I, I think one of the things is also, I think it's imperative that we do a, some sort of press release on media on this matter too, um, specifically on the increase in the disasters and FEMA reimbursements we're facing. You know, some of us saw the newspapers over here and online news providers earlier, but they're gone now. But I think it's critical that we uh, share this information community uh, because you know they they need to hear it as well that's it thank you i'll make a couple of comments also on that i think that that will they very well may be covering this uh remotely as we speak but i think that there is um something effective on the 18th that will probably help provide some greater clarity on on what 
uh, we can do. There, there's been a lot of, there's sort of three things here. One of them is that uh, what used to be bipartisan from a funding perspective is no longer. There was never historically emergency aid was was never questioned in Congress, and now it is. And so you just uh, that's a tough challenge. Number two, on the CRs that on the continuing resolutions that that Mr. Reed was talking about. They generally follow a disaster with an assumption that it's funding that disaster, but it's actually funding disasters from three, four, five, six years previous to that, which most folks don't realize. The third thing is that the federal government is starting to question longitudinally whether they should even fund these things because of the magnitude and scope of them. Um, this is what we're dealing with, even with sea level rise guidance and coastal commission and what what is the role of where development is allowed? What is the role moving forward? I mean, these are more policy focused questions, but I think that as the future boards are gonna realize these questions and mandates are gonna come into uh, conflict with economic or fiscal realities that the county has uh, that are not going to bode well for the county. I mean, there isn't, there shall be no winners in this situation. The question is how to mitigate the loss and what we're trying to do here through our advocacy and the folks that are coming on Monday are not, I mean, these are decision, we'll just say that they're decision-making level folks at FEMA um, that can actually make these decisions um, is just get us out of the ones that have already happened so we can be a baseline for the future ones that are going to happen. Um, and it's, it's not, it's a very sobering reality, but, um, and it shouldn't be whether a community has better advocacy than another one, right? I mean, these things should just be what they are, but, but here we are. Uh, in our community, and I think that at least effective Monday, we'll have a better sense of what needs to be issued from a debt perspective effective February, and, and we'll see where we move forward. It's a complicated issue. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on this item in chambers? Seeing none, is there anybody online? Seeing no speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. I think it's an acceptance file, one sec. Yeah, there's a couple of, of actions, including the language change from my colleagues. So if I'll move it to Supervisor Cummings, you want to articulate a motion? Yeah, I'll move it. I'll move the staff recommendations um, with the change of, rather than directing the chair of the board, it will be directing Supervisor Friend um, as appropriate in the uh, staff recommendation. Second. All right, we have a motion from Supervisor Cummings, a second from Supervisor Hernandez. We could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? I appreciate everybody that's here to address that issue. We'll move on to the final item of today's agenda, which is to item 11, consider directing the county administrative officer to return on or before February 27, 2024, to provide a report that reviews how Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 2.31 Public Works Projects Declaration of non-responsibility has been operationalized as outlined in the memo of Supervisors Koenig and Fernandez. Supervisor Koenig, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Chair. Well, to decipher that title a little bit, uh, when we go out to uh, award a project, whether it's a road project um, or a renovation of a building or construction of a new building, the county uh, is required to choose the lowest and responsible bidder. and. Uh, the uh, impetus for this item was learning that there are indeed cases where uh, some of the folks that we have uh, hired to to do the public's work uh, are engaged in uh, wage theft or worker mis misclassification, failure to comply with overtime requirements, uh, or underreporting workers on on certified payrolls. Um, and, I mean, not to mention uh, making it really difficult to uh, employ the uh, number. Of, uh, uh, of interns um, and other folks that are, are training for uh, these lines of work that they should be on these projects. So the question is, what are we actually doing to determine that people are responsible when we award these contracts? Um, and is there any review that's actually happening? Um, and for example, um, with a, one of the largest road contracts that we recently awarded for SoCal Drive, we awarded to Monterey Peninsula Engineering, uh, and this contractor has uh, decades of uh, recorded violations that have uh, cost them over five hundred thousand um, dollars. At what point do we deem someone, deem someone irresponsible, uh, and that we shouldn't actually award that contract to them? 
Um, furthermore, with uh, another contract that's currently being carried out with the Live Oak Library Annex, we've uh, there was a work stoppage there because the contractor did not pay at their subcontractor on time. And now that project is getting close to uh, six months and maybe as many as nine months overdue. Um, so I think that this deserves a review of how we define uh, the, the contractors that uh, submit bids to actually be responsible before we make those bids. And then the other piece of this is to look at opportunities to implement project labor agreements, because this is a tool that has been used uh, to really avoid precisely these kinds of situations. Um, we, of course, our county has used project labor agreements in the past with great success, um, notably on some larger projects like the Sheriff Center. And attached to this item today is a letter from Sheriff Jim Hart uh, talking about how uh, the project labor agreement that was put in place for that uh, actually really helped to deliver a successful project that was on time and on budget. Um, and then there are many communities across California that uh, have gone a step further and implemented master project labor agreements for that cover uh, all projects that uh, the county or jurisdiction is pursuing. Watsonville has a master project labor agreement. Alameda County does. Uh, Santa Barbara County recently implemented one. Santa Clara County. Um, so clearly this is a, is a tool that it can be successful. Um, what I'm suggesting here, what Supervisor Hernandez and I are suggesting uh, is to look at some of the projects that are coming up in the next uh, one to three years for our county and determine ones that could be good candidates for project labor agreements. Um, I know that there's at least a couple within the first district that could be good candidates, um, you know, including the Children's Crisis Stabilization Center. Um, which is a significant renovation project in order to uh, outfit that building for its new use, um, as well as the SoCal San Jose uh, road repairs um, and, and resurfacing. Um, and I, I do think it's important to look at some projects that, you know, the item calls for projects down to a million dollars. We know that project labor agreements can be successful uh, on larger projects, um, but many of what other communities are considering actually go down to, um, you know, the million dollar range. And so I think that we need to look at some horizontal road projects um, that are also in the, um, you know, million dollar plus amount in order to see uh, whether or not these agreements can be successful in, in these cases as well. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, we had the opportunity to do a um, PLA in the in Watsonville, and I think that it, it was important because an industry that's really known for uncertainties, project labor agreements really stand as a beacon for stability by bringing all stakeholders together under one agreement. They foster collaboration and prevent disruptions and ensure projects are built on time, on budget, with a skilled workforce and their not just a tool for efficiency, but they're an investment in a in a brighter future for in workforce for construction. Um, and I think that, you know, with the opportunity having to to see a PLA before and after, uh, and actually on the same road on Freedom Boulevard, I got to see the differences. Um, when we started one of the projects at the beginning of uh, Freedom Boulevard, it went from Stanford to Martin Alley. We saw many uh, delays, stoppages, and even lawsuits from the business owners uh, for, for those delays. And the, after the, the PLA, the continued projects on Freedom, uh, it was a Freedom Road reconstruction uh, repavement that included sidewalks um, and utilities too. Uh, it went flawless, you know, other than traffic, right? But that's always a good thing. People complained about the traffic. But the fact that we got all of freedom repaved uh, and we had even utility projects done, all all, all of those uh, su uh, wa sewer lines and water lines redone from uh, Cl Clifford to Green Valley. Um, it, it was piecemeal that we did the, the three projects on freedom. Um, the third one was from from. Uh, Loma Prieta to, no, the Green Valley one was from free, uh, freedom to. Pennsylvania Loma Prieta, but you know we had we had a, a, a contractors were granite granite rock and some of the other ones that I forgot, but it was completely night and day from the very first one we did on on um, Freedom Boulevard that went from um, 
uh, from Stafford to Martin Alley. Uh, that one was just horrible because we had such delays and stoppages and, you know, and so it didn't go good for us. So it was really night and day for us. And I think that the adoption of a PLA will also, you know, bolster apprenticeship opportunities that are much needed here. Um, you know, these these apprenticeships can lead to more jobs in the trades, and maybe our public works, and it'll foster family supporting careers. Uh, local apprenticeships are mandated by these agreements and in a community hiring provision opens avenues for residents to enter app apprenticeship programs. Uh, you know, overall, I think these trade the trades are important uh, factor in our communities. And so that's, you know, why I'm supportive of this. Well, I'll person. just add on, I'm supportive of the CAA looking into this and getting back to us in February. Uh, we have uh, many jurisdictions that have uh, project labor agreements and uh, they seem to be, it'll be interesting to learn more about them. I look forward to it. Uh, we'll open it up for the community. I, I believe we do have somebody who's been patiently waiting here today, so I appreciate you waiting. Not a problem, that's what we're here for. First of all, ladies, gentlemen, and supervisors, I want to thank you for talking about this. That's the first step, is sitting down and having the conversations, okay? We talked today, as I've been sitting here, older people still working, younger kids ain't got mental health. It all ties into that PLA. You give a kid a job, you don't worry about that kid because he can support himself and he can get married and support a family. If an older person, now I am 56 years old and I am already past my retirement date because I was in a union or I'm in a union. I could retire last year comfortably. That's what those things mean, a PLA. It hits your home. It hits your community. It hits your brother beside you and your lady friend on the other side. It does all that. And we talk about apprenticeship. That means kids from your schools, your families, getting an opportunity to make a living, a living wage with benefits. Those are the things that we need more than ever. We talked about wage theft, ivory towers in San Jose. How many of those folks were locked in a container and forced to work? You have an opportunity to lead your community into something that is so much more. I thank you. I thank you for what you're doing, how you're doing it, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Anybody else in the community like to address this in chambers? Anybody online? Yes, Chair. Albert, your microphone's now available. Good evening, uh, Board of Supervisors of Santa Cruz. My name is Alberto Lustre with the uh, Northern California Carpenters Union Local 505. And I'm here to, uh, today to fully support the PLA agreement for the Santa Cruz County because it's a crucial step forward, a healthier and more connected community. It also ensures that the projects are completed in a timely manner and up to standards or way above standards. The PLA ensures the fair labor wages and allowing the construction workers to live where they work, be able to spend time with their families and their loved ones. It also provides healthcare for the community, for the construction worker and his family, preventing them to become a burden to the system which happens when there's not a PLA. Local hire also eliminates the lengthy commutes, enabling workers to invest more time in their families, the community, and get involved in the community. Additionally, the apprenticeship programs create more opportunities for at least youth, minorities, and women, fostering a diverse and skilled careers in the construction industry. A PLA also prevents wage theft and fraud, fraud which also ha happens more than often on projects that don't have a PLA. Also, I want to ask the uh, board of supervisors, please look at the uh, uh, Hel 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 Helmets and Hair Hats ordinance in the city of Berkeley in the Yolo County uh, PLA. Those are good examples of good PLA that this county should, should, be, uh, should be adopting. 
And uh, and I will end- I will lay I will endorse the PLA for the strongest work here in Santa Cruz County. Thank you for your time and your support. Thank you. Anybody else online? Hey Zeus, your microphone is now available. Good afternoon, County of Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors. My name is Zeus Vega, and I have been a lifelong resident of Santa Cruz County. I appreciate appreciate the opportunity to advocate for the project labor agreement. This stands as a pillar for the welfare of our community. The PLA is more than a contract. It's a commitment that of the well-being of our construction workers and their families by providing essential health care coverage. It champions the livable wage, ensuring those who build our community can afford to live in it. Local hiring is not just a policy. It's a solution to lengthy commutes, which we all know, Highway 1, and fostering a sense of community. Additionally, the PLA opens doors through apprenticeship programs for our youth, minorities and women ensuring a diverse and skilled workforce. Let us combat wage theft and misclassification, creating a fair and just environment on our construction sites. Your support of the PLA is an investment in, our, in the prosperity and fairness of our community. Thank you. Appreciate it. See no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you for everybody that commented. I'll bring it back to the board. I believe there's additional comments, Supervisor Cummings. Yeah. Well, first, I want to thank um, Supervisors Koenig uh, and Hernandez for bringing this forward and bringing uh, this to our attention. I just wanted to ask staff on some of the comments that were brought up around some of these projects where um, there's contractors that have, you know, not met timelines and not been paying. Like, what's the oversight of those types of contractors? Because I just, you know, I, I hear some of the concern that's being expressed and just want to understand what kind of oversight the county has. That directed to me, sir? No. Okay. Back to me. Back to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Matt Machado, Director of CDI. Uh, so the oversight you're asking for those contracts when things don't go right? So we do uh, we do have oversight, of course. We withhold retentions to make sure the contractor is doing right. Uh, and in some cases, I think Supervisor Koenig mentioned it, we'll get a stop notice from subcontractors when they're not being paid properly. Uh, and then we can withhold retention until it's uh, settled. Now, sometimes it takes courts and actions like that that we don't get involved in. Uh, but holding the purse strings does give us quite a bit of authority and um, responsibility to ensure that all the subs and all the workers are paid properly. And we take that very seriously. And I feel like we've had great success in, on our projects. Uh, it doesn't say It doesn't mean that all the contractors are running smooth, but from our perspective, we enforce that everybody's paid properly at the end of the job. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess with that, I want to support the recommendations that were brought forward. So I'm happy to move the recommended action, but I want to add some additional direction. Um, I've been in touch with some of the labor unions as well regarding this topic, and there was an interest as was discussed, that was brought up today to have a discussion. And I think the best way we can understand how this could work for the county and is if we're having our county staff talking with the unions to see what a PLA could look like for the county. So the additional direction I'm going to add is to direct the CAO and county staff to enter into discussion with the trades to determine the feasibility of the county adopting a PLA for significant county projects and bring recommendations for the board to consider on or before the first meeting in April. I'll second it. Uh, can, if we can look, look at looking at some of the best practices at some of the other PLAs that were in the packet as well. Okay. Um, another thing is, you know, I just wanted to add, I know everybody already said their piece, but I, on, any, on any given day, I think that about 40 to maybe about 70 or 80% of our large projects that we have are practically PLA pro, uh, projects already in our, our union jobs. So it ain't like it's something new. It's like something that we've been doing already. Uh, so I just wanted to add that. So thank you. We have a motion and a second. Um, is there any additional discussion? All right. All, are there any questions on the clarification? All right. Uh, yes. Oh, go ahead. So I did have some clarification on the motion. Are you? Are you? Um, is is the maker of the motion moving staff recommendation and then adding an additional direction to come back with something different and additional in April? Yes. Okay. Yes, because um, what what is recommended. Um, by Supervisors Koenig and um, Hernandez uh, really focuses on 
the report the reviews of Santa Cruz County Code SCC 2.31. Public Works Project's declaration of non-responsibility has been operationalized, including how bidders are reviewed for responsibility and how this review process could be improved in the future to prevent untrustworthy contractors from being awarded work. And then it asks to identify 10 planned county projects of a million or more um, upcoming over the next three years that could benefit from project labor agreements. So it's really focused on the policy and the project. And the additional direction I'm providing is that there's been discussion around having the county have its own PLA. And my direction is having the county staff enter into discussion with the trades to start discussing how we can create a PLA that will be feasible for us to implement here in the county. And the idea would be that they would come back in April and just giving folks time because we know we're entering the holidays. We know these things take time and work. County staff's going to need to investigate and look at other counties and what kind of best practices they've used. And then they would bring back recommendations for us to consider in early April or on or before the first meeting in April. Thank you. That provides the clarity that I was looking for, that, that the whole item isn't being moved to April. But do you have any other questions? I, I do. Um, I caught what I think may have been a possible friendly amendment from Supervisor Hernandez regarding looking at best practices. Put it in there. It, is that in there it, as well? Yeah, I think what Supervisor okay. Hernandez included was looking at other counties that have implemented PLAs for best practices. Okay. Their PLA on. And we would like that reflected in the additional direction? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. If we could have a roll call, please. Yes, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. 